What's happening, everyone? All right. By the way, you just fucked me wearing this suit. <laughs> no even joke. I know I usually in the past to always fucking try wear a fancy dress, but I went and spent two hundred quid on good club of the day for Reese. And they like, no, this man. Zara, was wasn't it, Reese? Yeah, Zara. Zara, but this man fucking, this is horrendous. You it's hard, it's hard to know where the suit ends and the face starts, don't it? <laughs> 200 quid to look like a UPS delivery driver. <laughs> Some going it. <laughs> Jim Carrey and Pet Detective, isn't it? <laughs> right, lads, listen. First ever open goal fans forum brought to you by Glenn's Vodka. SPFL Manager of the Month Award. Uh, we've got uh, an audience, obviously, 100 people here. Social media fan influencers. Is that how you like to be called? Is it? YouTubers, podcasters, virgins, what? <laughs> <laughs> I'm only joking, lads. We love your stuff. Um, who's, it you, who's it you like? Fitzsimmons. Oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> You're a lying bastard, Paul. Uh, so, I have a chance to ask questions. Challenge our panel tonight on current issues happening at their club. Also, need to give a massive thanks to Bad Nori Innes. What a guy. Thanks for giving us Bad. What a venue. Get yourself down for a pint anytime. So, the nine fans that we've got, we've got Andy Halliday from the Heart and Hand podcast. Andy Halliday from the Heart and Hand podcast. And then eight others that I've never fucking heard of. Nah, I'm only joking, lads. I'm, that's me done for you, but he is going to come for you. So, we're oh, going to... A, honestly, genuinely, I think he's a brilliant. Right, we'll, ch we'll kick the chat off. Uh, recent announcement, this month's winner is once again fucking Ange Postacoglu. <laughs> we'll be there again, Si. Even the Rangers fans clap there. <laughs> uh, he's now won the award on every occasion this season. Is it deserved? James McFadden. Aye. Simply. Based on... Well, the, the top of the league, they've opened up a, a seven-point gap. I know it's kind of strange because it's been put out two months, but they're, they're the best team. So I know that you know when other teams do well, it's it's, it's difficult to to gauge because they're so consistent. You know the amount of games that we've played September, October has been unheard of, to be honest. So I think the team that's been the most consistent, the best team. I've said on the podcast it. before, Fadi, that. This is my favourite type of football I've seen. Would you go along with that? Is there a team that you've seen that you think are, are no, maybe better because of the standard of player, but the type of football that, that Celtic are playing? No, I think the, the, the overall style has been the best since I can remember as well. Better than Rodgers? Without doubt for me. Aye. Better than Rodgers. I think that the fact that how quick he's got his team playing, the way exactly he wants to play, the, how versatile they can be with their team selection. It's not, a, it's not a, oh, that's our strongest 11. There will always be debate or who the best 11 are. But if he's into a game and he's made a few changes, they get to that point where they change the, the front three, couple of midfielders, and you think, they're not any weaker. They're, they might actually be stronger here. Um, I think that some of, this, some of the football they play is incredible. It really is. You like John Barnes' team better. Well, he was outstanding, Big Barnes. <laughs> Fucking brilliant. But I would listen, and, and I love Andrew, you know, but my only thing I would put out there is when Lennon got put out of uh, Europe, I think it was in the qualifiers at the start of the season, there was an uproar with the fans. Now, Ange in Europe hasn't done well. <laughs> Do you know what I mean, though? Yeah. So is that uh, a big question mark for you, So, still? no, what, what I would say is, though... <laughs> so you want him out? No, yeah. no. <laughs> no, I think he's absolutely amazing, but I would say that in Europe... They have spent no bad Celtic, 20 million um, this season. I think we should have done better in the group we were in. Listen, Leipzig are fucking, we're outstanding. Real Madrid, but Shakhtar, I mean, I said it the other week, they'd only spent 5 million. Let their full team go. Um, they beat Leipzig away. You've had that one waiting. You couldn't wait to give that point. To All last night, you just kept repeating it myself. <laughs> I would actually, I know, the, is it, are we bringing some of the boys in? Well, that's a good point to bring in Ryan then, because obviously Celtic fans, it seems, are, are in love with Big Ange, but... Do you take Slaney's point on board about the European record? We've stitched you up here, lads, didn't we? The mic's not even fucking working. In fact, just take his place, Ryan. You'd probably be more fucking used. Do I need to take the track suit? I know. Or can I get away with that? Um, no, what was I going to say? Um, the European point, right, I get it. Aye, it's a good point. But can you not see what Anne's just saying in the sense that we've improved what we're doing in the park? We're getting there. And I think for the first time being in the Champions League under him, you look at the team, I think there's only two or three of them who've played the Champions League before, to have a first-time experience under him and all the players, there's a positive sign. I'm, I'm pretty ambitious. I'm pretty excited for the next time round. We had a tough group there. Madrid, 
Shakhtar, Leipzig. If we took our chances, it could have been different. I know that's if buts and maybes, you know, that shape. But um, I, I was I was quite impressed with what I seen the other the, the course of the six games. I think we were just unlucky on, on certain occasions. So that's my point there. It says here you're the co-founder of the Talk Scottish Football Podcast. Yes. The other founder is Paul the Tim, but he's got a restraining <laughs> order on Slaney. So he's not coming right. And also the host of the Celtic Podcast, right? Yes, that's myself, bye. Good. So what do you review games? I we do talk about everything, talk same same amount of shite as usual a lot day, you know. We, we, we try our best, eh? Good man. Good. Uh, Andy, what's your thoughts on the, the European stuff? Well, in terms of manager of the month, I agree with Fad, it's deserved. Uh, seven games, six wins, obviously the one defeat being the St. Mirren game, but 30 goals scored in seven games. It's crazy, really, isn't He's it? done his homework for that's, the have you, have That's you, how you do it. Have you still his sheet of paper? That's how you do it, wee man, just a couple <laughs> of notes. But in terms of European stuff, Honestly, I looked at the group when it was drawn and I thought Celtic could get out of that group. I really did. I, listen, it's a difficult group, but like Slaney said, I think Shakhtar hadn't played domestic football for a, a long period of time. I thought Leipzig would obviously be a tough challenge, but I, I would have fancy Celtic part to you know, take the points at home. I think if you look at their performances over the points, they were probably unlucky. You've got to say they were unlucky. I think they performed really well against Real Madrid at home. Uh, Shakhtar away. How they never won the game, I don't know. And I think their performances probably showed that they can compete at that level, definitely. I still think there is a disappointment there. I don't, no, don't get me wrong. I still think they'll feel as if they should have done more than they've done. But you know, you've got to take Angie's point. Uh, you know, they're trying to compete at that level. They're trying to implement their style. And it's going to take a couple of transfer windows to, to get where they want to be. What a man. Ryan, you got a question for the panel? Um, but he's fed up talking to Angie or he's wanting something new. Honestly, mate, I could talk to him all day. He's brilliant, isn't he? Uh-huh. That's the thing. I was going to say, like, do you get the sense, uh, you know, he's obviously came here here, no, nobody really knew who he was, but he, he feels like he's got something special around him. Do you see when you talk to him, is, is, he, is he unique in that sense? Do you know what? He, he's, again, take away who, who he manages. He's just a great guy. He actually, he's got a genuine interest in what you're doing as well, which I found amazing for a Celtic manager. We, we interview other managers, mate, who they walk in the room, they're like, right, come on, we need to get started. You get 40 minutes with them. As soon as the 40 minutes is done, somebody does that to them, they need to go. Ange comes in 15 minutes, asks how you're getting on, how the podcast doing, how the team's doing. Twice, on two occasions, his PA's walked in and said, that's the time done. He's like, no, let the lads have as much time as they like. And then after it, you'll stay with five minutes. And I think that goes a long way in terms of how successful he is, just the fact that he's a really good human being. Eh? He reminds me a lot of Tommy Burns because he's got a great sense of humour as well, hasn't he? He helped you a lot, though, say. Si- when we, the last he never time. helped us that much, we're fucking hopeless. <laughs> <laughs> but he did help you though, didn't he? Half camera, he helped you a lot. I know, he gave us a lot of good advice, obviously, I'm not going to go into it in too much detail, but at the start of my managerial career, I was my head was all over the place, and just a 15 minute chat with him, mm-hmm. it made us feel like I was kind of going in the right direction, he'd had similar problems, a wee bit of advice here and here, so I, I just think he's a, a great guy. He still doesn't really get me, doesn't he know? He still doesn't know your name. <laughs> <laughs> he must do. He's interviewed him six times. <laughs> uh, wait, 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 sorry, uh, Sai, si, if you don't mind. Fadi, what do you think about the, the European thing there, what I was saying? Is because I think the size of Celtic... And by the way, it's a compliment I'm putting to Ange there because how well I think a manager is, how well I think he's doing with Celtic. And I think that I expected him to do better than that group. I think that when when he speaks after a game, you know, covering, covering the games, you look at it and say, right, well, Celtic have had chances. They've turned up and tried to play their style. They've no changed. But and, and he'll highlight that, but he's never he's never once said I'm I'm happy with what's happening. They what he felt as though they could compete. Um and I I just I just like his approach to everything. It doesn't matter who they're playing. They play the same way. They try and win the game the exact same way. Um and he's he's no one said I'm happy with we're, we're losing or no winning games they think they should win. But what he's what he's always hammered home is his message that his i his ideas and his beliefs will bring them success, and I know like mo- a lot of people look at it and say, "Why don't you just show up? Why do you not play two defensive midfielders and, and try and be a wee bit more cagey?" But that's not what he want. Mm. want. That's not how he sees the game. He sees the game a certain way, and he, he wants to go and test. It is a test when you go into that level of football. It's a test for a player. It's a test for a manager. It brings that question: Can can my system work? against the best results wise you would say it's no worked performance levels have been I think they've been excellent I really do they've, they've had chances to win 
each game. The last game, obviously, at the Bernabeu is a tough one, but they've had chances at crucial moments in the games where you think, right, OK, there's a manager, that's, there's a guy that's come in and everybody ridiculed him. It doesn't matter. Even his biggest supporters now will say there's, there's always a question mark as though he's just arrived for a different planet because he's no managed in Europe or a big club that, that, that we know about. He's taken Australia to the World Cup. He's managed in, in the J-League and won trophies. But when he came in, everybody's like, right, OK. And your first impression of a manager or a person or a player, whoever, when they open their mouth, you think, right, what have you got? What are you going to tell me? And he spoke about his style. He spoke about the performance levels of his teams. And if the teams perform the way he wants, they'll get results. It's not about results. And everybody went, <laughs> No, you need you need to you win. win you need to win games, mate. You need to winning's everything. And it was almost like we didn't get him. We didn't understand what he meant. Through time, you've seen it where when they win games, he speaks about how they've played. When they lose games, he speaks about how they've played. It's not to say he accepts defeat, but he looks at how his team have played. Have they have they been able to play how they want to play to to get a result? And and if they've come up short, but they've still tried to play the way they want. It's not that he accepts it, but he can see that there's there's a chance to progress. I think he's been absolutely brilliant for Scottish football. Go on, Andy, you've got some. So, I was going to ask Faddy, I always think as a manager, right, s sometimes you need to be adaptable. And people keep asking the questions, <laughs> is Ange Postecoglou going to change his style in Europe, right? And the answer's clearly no. I think we've seen enough evidence of that. But do you think there is something they can adapt, maybe out of position, in position, that can help them a wee bit better when they go to the Bernabeu, for example, when you're not going to dominate 70% of the ball? Um... Well, there, there, there is, but he's not going to do it. And I think that if you look at the games, if you use going to the Bernabeu, that's almost a free hit because people expect you to go and get blown away. And I know they lose the game heavily, but again, I'll go back to it. And it's it's difficult for when you're emotional about a game or, or you if it's you know an opposition fan, they want to see them fail. They look at the result and, and go, right, well, they get battered. But... In each and every game, they've had big chances at big moments mm. of games through their style, through how he sees the game. Now, if you if you put players in a position and you get your opportunities through how you see the game and a guy misses for 10 yards where he should score, that's not your style. See, that's that, not your idea. Do you think the players miss their chances next year after a year of being in the competition already? Or does that not come in at I don't Do know. Do they just need better quality players at that level? I think you just need to take your chances when you get them. If you're playing domestically, you get... I know, but why do they miss the chances? Because look at Abida on Saturday. I said on the podcast today, if that Dundee United goalie had a Real Madrid stop strip on, mate, that ball would have been in fucking Rosette. Aye. Whereas Dundee United, he chips the ball the goalie against Real Madrid, he panics and hits the ball wide. So well, why that, is that? But that could be the, the, the mentality of the player. You know, as you say, it's Dundee United. If I chip it and it doesn't go in, we're winning 3-2 anyway. It doesn't really matter if you're nil now and you're in a game. I think you need to get, if you're playing domestically, you're going to get three or four chances, five chances a striker. If you're playing Europe, you need, you're maybe thinking, I might only get one chance. And I don't know if the tension comes into it. I don't know if you get too many thoughts going through your mind at that point in time. I don't know. that You would like to think they'll learn for it and get better. But I think that you need to try and improve it as a squad bring better players in that maybe tightens up that mentality to say, right, if I get a chance, I'm going to score it. I don't need another chance. I don't need three chances. If I get one chance, I'm going to score it. See, I think Ange realises that though. If you, if you listen to his comments at the AGM last week, it, it kind of hints at the idea that nobody's really safe, you know, that the, everybody's got their favourites, but things will change. I think he knows that. I think he knows that he needs to keep improving. And I made the point in my own podcast that, you know, even the likes of Cal McGregor, as good as he is, there's always somebody better that can come in. And I think Ange knows that. If there's somebody there, he'll bring them in. I'm not saying that's happening to McGregor. That, that's the one player I would disagree no, on. Bill, I'm not saying it'll happen to McGregor. I absolutely know him. But even somebody as good as him, if there's somebody, there and Ange knows that he'll bring them in so Kyogo, Jack and Marcus all these guys are fan favourites we might love them we might score goals week after week but if, if Ange can get somebody better than that I think he's not scared to go out and get them and get, get a replacement in see on that are the players that they've brought in this summer better than what was there before though is Jens better than Starfield is Moy better than <laughs> I don't know if I'd say any of them. Well, Jens is Haxabanovic he comes in I think he's he's probably somebody who could be a starting player in the next few months I think if you're looking at your wingers Jota on the right him on the left I think Jens 
you know, he's in a situation where he's came in, he's had to fill in for stuff out while he's injured, so it's, it's, it's difficult. But I think he's done a decent job in that. Um, I don't think anybody really expected him to be much more than a backup player. Um, but I, I think we'll learn through the summer, and I, I think we'll see that in the winter because I think players will leave, and I think other players will come in. Well, we, we actually debated this on the podcast today. I think an issue Celtic have got, which is a very good issue to have, by the way, is for them to bring in, their squad's already pretty big, so they probably do need to get rid of one or two. Who did they get rid of? Because the ones that are on the periphery, the maybe the James McCarthy's and who was it you said? That's his answer every time. Uh, who you get rid of James McCarthy? I mean, they've, they've, got, they've, got three, <laughs> they've got three years left in their contract though. So uh, right. the ones that are sort of involved, it's, they're doing so well, they're going to try and strengthen again. The likes of, I think you mentioned Stephen Welsh, didn't you? But I mean, no. <laughs> they've, rejected, they've rejected six bids. They've rejected six bids for Stephen Welsh. Van Bronckhorst, now we were talking about it today. Um, it does feel with a lot of the, my pals or Rangers fans, it does sound that they've had enough of Van Bronckhorst. Listen, I'm on the other side, and I'm not just saying that from a Celtic point of view. I think he's, um, I think he's done a hell of a lot. Yeah, you do, you do stick up for him quite a bit. Stuck up for him. Um, you look at that Europa League run last year, which was absolutely incredible. And I'll be honest, I didn't think Scottish club could do what they done. I really didn't for a long time. Um, then in the misty that side, extra time, extra time, extra time, they come back and beat Celtic, who were a great side last season um, in the semi-final, win the Scottish Cup. Listen, we're very obviously unlucky, penalty shoot out of the way if you win the Europa League. So he done that with the Scottish Cup. And then Bassey went for a lot of money. Aribo left two great players for Rangers. He then knocked out, by the way, a real good side in PSV to get into the Champions League, which was a brilliant achievement. Now I get, and I'll be the first to say, it's not been acceptable the performances this season. But to only spend 12 million in the summer side when you've let go Bassey, Aribo, when you brought in the Champions League money, the Europa League money. So here's a question for you. Do you think that squad's good enough to compete with Celtic? No. You, would you be the same? Yeah, I would say the same. You, you so then it isn't the Van Bronckhorst's fault? Well, I think it, there's, there's more than... The manager carries a can, as you will find out very soon, mate. Because I'm finding um, it. <laughs> <but> <laughs> The, the manager is the guy that fronts it. He's the guy that speaks to the media. He speaks about performances. He speaks about, you know, Gio spoke about the budget, not being able to compete against teams in Europe. Um, so he's the guy that fronts it. But there, there is, for me, there's more of an issue than just the manager. I look at the players, the, the so-called big players. They're not performing. The, and the recruitment has to come into it. Because it's, it's Lenny made a brilliant point about the money they've brought in. The recruitment this summer, the two biggest outlays were on a left back and a centre back, Yilmaz and Davis. Mm. And I know you need to replace the players that, that have left. You know, Bassey could fill that left centre back or left back. Bassey was brought in for 200 grand on, you know, a compensation. Rebo was the same. So that, I've said this before, it's difficult when you then, everybody looks at you and says you've got all this money to try and bring a replacement in for a player you've essentially got for next to nothing. Mm. Two players who were massive players for Rangers, who they, who they, whoever it was identified them, brought them in, they've had the impact, they've, had, they've sold them, made good money on them. So it's, it's difficult then, but it's more than the manager for me. The players need to take responsibility. The manager, without doubt, has to take responsibility because he's the one that's putting the team out. He's the one that's setting them up. And yesterday, you know, he spoke about uh, Rangers could have won the game after half an hour through then, what, 10 passes ago. Mm. They, they weren't creating chances. They weren't putting St. Johnson under any immense pressure. They weren't defending, you know, every time the ball came in, they didn't really, the, the goalkeeper wasn't tested. So I think there's... There's a collective for Rangers. It just seems to have gone really bad. But on the flip side of that, I think that yesterday Callum Davison was the first manager, or the, sorry, the second manager to beat him domestically. And the other one's Ange Postacoglu. Mm -hmm. So it, it's tough. They're so far behind Celtic in terms of performance. Everything that you speak about Celtic, their style, the manager, how they want to play, strength of their squad. They can make six changes a week. It doesn't impact how they play. Rangers are playing with a squad that is thin. They, they don't have the options. Connor Goldson, who never misses 
any games mm. is out and he's out for a while. Um, you bring in Yilmaz, he's no fit, he's no fit to play. Pierce, uh, Davis is taking so long to, to get into the side. They don't have a, a squad at the minute, Rangers, that they, that they can call upon. The players that have played well for them over the last period of games is Davis, Arfield, their best player at this point in time, which is a big problem for them, is Fashion Sakala. He's the most impactful player that looks like he's actually trying to create something. So there is a problem. Having said all that, and for how poor their performances have been, they're only, they're only seven points. Now, it's a lot, but it's no really. There, there is a chance, but I think that ultimately managers carry the can, but there is a, there is a collective that, that the players need to stand up. I don't know what's happening with recruitment. I don't know who's making the decision on the players. My final point in this... Are you on a fucking... Are you on a pen or a word tonight? What the <laughs> Faddy? Faddy. My last point would be the managers managed in Holland for five, uh, four years. Feyenoord. He's not signed a player no, for that. that was my we point. said that the day. That, yeah. I that, the point. that was actually my point and you stole it off his up there. <laughs> Kid, no, Faddy, who, who is ultimately to blame then? Is it the players? Is it the manager? Is it further up than that? Is it the board? Is it the recruitment? Or is it a collection? Is it, is it all of them? Because at the moment, obviously, the situation is, is dire. Do you we, think? We, we don't know. We don't know the ins and outs. So, I think so it's a bit of both. You go to the manager because you don't know about recruitment. We're guessing about recruitment. We're guessing about the players. We're guessing about how, how they train. We're guessing about the tactics. So ultimately, it goes to the manager because he's the one that's up front, front of house taking all the, all the flack, dealing with all the questions. I look at the players and say, I've played, I've played for managers that don't particularly inspire me, that maybe I don't like, but my job is to play football. And I don't care that I don't like them because I've got my own pride. So I think there's a collective. I think the writing was on the wall a wee bit for Giovanni when he came out after the Ajax game and basically says that Rangers can't compete at this level. And Andy, I would ask you as, as a player, obviously, if you heard your manager coming out and saying pretty much... You have no chance. How would you feel? Would you then go into games like Rangers have in the Champions League and then as soon as you can see the goal or whatever, as soon as it's no gone your way, the heads are down? Is the manager going to set a precedent by saying that in his post-match against Ajax? Well, you, you asked if I was a player, how would I feel? My response would probably be it's the same players that competed against Borussia Dortmund, the same players that competed against RB Leipzig. It was the same players that six months prior got to a Europa League final. So overnight, these aren't the bad players. You know, Slaney mentioned how Rangers have spent £11 million or £12 million, whatever it is. That's still a lot of money to make good signings. But the importance is that the signings you make have got to be right. There's, I think everybody will agree. There's question marks over quite a number of the signings they made in, in the summer there. We rained off, Faddy rained off a couple of players there. James Tavenier cost two hundred grand. Alfredo Morelos cost half a million. You know, Glenn Kamara, who was reported to go for an £8 million fee last year, went for fifty grand. Connor Golson was two million, but go over to Celtic. Matt O'Reilly went for one point five. Hatati two million. So I mean, there's there's players out there that you can get for good money and in, in amongst that eleven million, million pound budget. Now, how much does Giovanni Van Broekhorst know about Rabi Matondo that they spent three million on? Ben Davies that they spent four million on. I mean, he, he he got the job, and a couple of weeks later they took John Suter, who obviously has at Hearts. How much was he involved in that signing? I don't know. So uh, can and you see on text that? Text take Suter. <laughs> see, see on that uh, you look at the players that have come in John Souter for me is similar to Conor Goldson so were they maybe thinking Goldson's not going to sign a the contract point. he did play on the left side of Hearts I, I know things, but didn't he? the way that he can be used best stepping into play hitting his diagonals hitting you know the striker he, he's more comfortable on the right I know he can play on the left but I think that to me it looked like he was maybe a replacement for Goldson You've got Matondo, who you mentioned, who's a left winger. Yeah. Who gets played in the right. The recruitment. Fanny, I've lost count how many times I've said in the podcast that Rangers have not signed a right winger since Daniel Kandace in 2016. We keep saying you, you could play there, no? No, no, no uh, chance. Definitely not. We'll get the pace. Goal scoring fullback. Surely he scored goals to the right wing. It's the same sort of issues that Rangers fans have asked for over the last six or seven transfer windows. Like, how have they not signed a right winger? I mean, it's 2022. Now they're still playing Scott Arfield right wing. Now, Scott Arfield's been a very good player for Rangers. He's one of my good pals. And he's probably still been one of the ones that made a positive impact this year. But he wasn't a right winger when he was 24, never no. made 33. Ne neither's Tom Lawrence, who's played there. Neither's Malik Tillman, who's played there. So it's still a problematic position. Now, that 
for me, Disney fall under Giovanni Van Bronckhorst. No. If you've got a sporting director, it's his job to identify their targets and ultimately get them right when you're going to spend the money. Now, I mentioned Ange Postecoglou earlier, where I do think he deserves a lot of respect in how his approach has been in Champions League football, even though they've maybe not got the points. I think everyone's came away for the games and says, do you know what, though, they competed at that level. Now, Rangers draw, when that was made, nobody fancied them to go through. But the issue was, I, I think everyone would agree, would be the manner at all the performances, to be honest. I don't, I don't think, I don't think any... we expected Napoli to be as good as what they were. No, yeah. I'd agree with you, but for a team that just got to Europa League final six months prior, I don't think there was any self-belief in any of the games that they were going in to win it. Whether that was Ajax at home, Napoli away, you're saying that we never realised how good they were, but I mean, we knew Dortmund were good. We knew mm-hmm. Leipzig were still a good team. And do, do you think that changed though? Results. Because... La- last mean, year, you just going, you're just going to sit upstairs and let you two fucking chat. His mic stunt half again. Fucking hell. <laughs> La- last year, it was, oh no, it's Dortmund. Oh no, it's Leipzig. And then you get through it and then you go to the final and everybody's like, Rangers actually could go and win this. So you go for being an underdog to then making your way into the Champions League thinking, this is actually not a bad group. So the expectation's higher. The belief in the players is probably higher. Mm. And their expectations higher. Do you, do you think that has an impact on how the players then approach the games? I, I do. I but I do think there's definitely been a different approach to how the teams approach the game. I, I remember watching. Everyone will be the same when Rangers played Dortmund away from home in the first leg. I couldn't believe Rangers approached the game with a high press, trying to get after Dortmund, a team with the attacking talent they had. And Rangers went into that game fully believing they were going to get something from it. There's no doubt in my mind. Whereas you're looking at the first game away from Ajax. I mean, it wasn't a low block, it wasn't a medium block, it wasn't a press, it wasn't a tackle, there was no aggression in certain areas of the pitch. To me, it was just a team that's done so well in Europe under a manager that showed that he's more than competent in, at European football. They just, they never looked as if they believed they were going to get in for the game. Now, like I said, if, if Rangers went through the campaign, played the way they can and still never get through, I don't think there would be any question marks over the manager's job or, or, or what he can do at that level, but Man, the man of defeats, I think, has been the bigger issue. But why has it changed so much? I mean, the start of the season, they beat PSV. You know what I mean? It's a, it's a good... <laughs> listen, uh, Rangers, position I now, Rangers position now is not a hard luck story. I, I've seen a lot of people talking about the centre-half issues, right? And, it, and it's, it's no great. Don't get me wrong. Conor Ghost is our best centre-half. I still believe that, and I don't think anyone talks about it enough, that Philip Hollander's our second best centre-half. Because I think he's been a massive player for Rangers whenever he's played, he's been injured. Obviously, Sopey, John Suter has been injured. They've had a lot of issues in that area of the pitch, but scoring goals is an issue. Creating is an issue. Conceding goals is an issue. So is, I don't it, is that the approach as well? Because you look at last year, Tavernier, no goals, assists. They're no, they're, he's not having the same effect. No. Barisic's levels have dropped dramatically for me over the last couple of years in terms of his, his creativity, his goal threat, his willingness to get forward. Does that come for the, the, the manager? Is that the... The tactics are trying but to... He, he got his tactics play. spot on in most big games last yeah. year, whereas his tactics this year have been poor, I think. You think about the Livingston game who play with three centre-backs and all Rangers done was cross the ball in the fucking box to the three centre-backs the full game. Whereas last year he was getting the tactics spot on, especially in Europe. But there just seems to be a real lack of identity at Rangers. It doesn't know, they don't look like they're playing a high up the pitch, whether they're sitting back the pitch. Uh, I, said, I know, I think I've always tried to stay very consistent and... It'll be the same whether I'm talking about Rangers or St. Bernard or Livingston tonight. I, I'll never sit here and say somebody should lose their job. Never will. I'm still a professional. I'll still treat others like professionals. I, th- I do think it'd be harsh to sack the manager. I really do. Because I, I do believe he's not been backed as much as you should have. But still a big part of your job is getting the best out of the players you've got. And he's still got some very good players at the club. And you've just mentioned a few of them. You could count in your one hand how many Rangers players have performed this year. Andy. Who does that fall on? Is that fall on players, managers? Would you concede that he's not getting the best out of the players that he's got then at the moment? Because like Ryan Kent, for example, isn't he performing to his maximum? Faddy spoke about James Tavernier there and talking about goals and assists. I think we've relied heavily too much on a right back to get more goals and assists. Ryan Kent's a man who's a winger, a star winger, and he's not been contributing to that. So would you concede then maybe that the manager isn't he getting the best out of the guys? Like yeah, Ken. no, I agree with you. I think that's, I mean, that's what I'm saying. I think that's the sort of big question mark now. And we're talking about, by the way, performances in Europe. Performances domestically haven't been good either. They've not been. And I think 
you're starting to give them praise for getting over the line in a lot of games. Like you know, you talk about the Livingston away in the first game of the season. There's been numerous of them this year where you think, do you know what? Rangers only played well, but they're getting points. I mean, it was only three weeks ago there were two points behind Celtic, and we kept saying it feels like ten. It did feel like ten because Celtic are beating people five 0 Rangers are winning two one, just getting over the line. And I keep trying to sort of defend it by saying, just signing a good team, no playing well, and getting over the line. But we're in November now. You know, the, the form's not really changed. Their best performance, unfortunately, has probably been against us at Hearts this year. So, I believe he still deserves a little bit of time. He needs to get back in January. Whether people think he will or not, he was saying the other day that he needs to get back. He was saying the other day that he, he know they're working on bringing players in, but he doesn't know how many he needs. Uh, that, that's worrying, isn't it? I don't know how because I think he spoke about. I think Div and if there are any other Rangers fans in here, could definitely name two or three positions. Div, where do you see them needing players? Obviously, Andy's mentioned right wing. Would you go along with that? Where else do you see? I absolutely. I was going to interject a, a bit ago and say we keep signing centre mids to play right wing. I don't. I, I, I honestly don't understand what, yeah. what the thinking is there. Uh, definitely as a position that we need to strengthen in. Also, we've got players running at a contract like Alfredo Morelos. He's just bench warming at the moment. Is he a guy that you get rid of in January in order to free up the funds to bring in somebody better in the midfield, maybe a powerhouse? Or I don't know, somebody who's going to make a change for Rangers in this title race if they're still in it. I mean, you go, go to Celtic last year and they went out in January and they got your Rio Hattatis, you got your Matt Riley. So, Obviously, Rangers can still potentially do something in January. Is Alfredo Morelos getting rid of him, freeing up funds? Well, well, would, you, would you take money for Morelos and Kent in January? At the moment, with our performances, you would have to think so. Yeah. Especially with Alfredo Morelos, because he's not even playing. What I would say is it's a travesty if they both leave in a free. Because they've been the two exactly. the clubs. Two of the, th- two of the three, they two and James Tavernier, have been the club's biggest assets for five years. And I think it's unforgivable if the two of them end up leaving in a free transfer. I mean, who's, who's to blame for that? I'm not too sure, uh, whether that's the board, sport director, manager. But for me, and it's easy to sit here and say that for the outside, but you, you approach them with a contract in the summer there. You say, you signed that, or we're selling you the new. Yeah. We need, we who, who's going to buy them, though? At this point in time, who's At this who's point in time, probably nobody, but that, that, that's my point. So you need to try and tie them up in a free, because you can't have them walking away free. I agree with you. We're talking about last year or the year before that, was it Nantes in France or Lille in France? Lille, that made man. a £15 million pound bid for Alfredo Morelos. Ryan Kent's been linked with clubs basically every year, whether there's been bids on them, I'm not too sure, but it was definitely linked with Leeds. So you can't then lose these players for a free transfer, regardless if they've had a, a poor year or not. See, if you've not got full confidence in Van Bronckhorst if you're on the board, why are you going to give money in January? Why keep him then? If you've not got full confidence in them, like you're saying. Aye. So if they keep them, they have got confidence in them. So you've got to back them. Do you think they will keep them before the World Cup comes? It looks like it. It looks like it. Honestly, see his comments, I'll go back to that. See what he says after Ajax. I think it was a plead. Aye, I hate I that. honestly yeah. thought he was going to resign uh, the following morning and I don't know why. Aye. Managers well, you said don't resign. Was in the camp no, exactly, because they'll not get shown for, they'll not get paid up. I, know, I think it was almost like a plead where I, if I say it bad enough, because if you look at Giovanni Van Bronckhorst, he's always been very measured in what he says. Um, and he came out and it was, some of the comments he made after that was pretty ridiculous. So it was almost, do I think, thought as a he fan, says, he's wanting the, the board to sack him. Do you think what he says matches what's happening? Do you think I, I feel like he's went back on it almost, because he's pretty much said we couldn't compete at that level and then he's tried to in his post matches after Napoli and, and Liverpool again, he's tried to say that we can. So I don't know, to I be mean, honest. You're talking about interviews. Everyone seems to forget his interview after PSV when they do qualify for the Champions League. I mean, watch that back. He is literally pleading for players. He yeah. says, we've got aye, this aye. money for Champions League. Did he, aye? You know, we need to strengthen when we go into this group stage. And for that, they never sign one other player for the end of the, the window shut. So I feel sorry for him in that respect as well, though, because. It, go back to what you were saying as well, Faddy. Like we signed Yelmaz for a significant fee. We signed Ben Davies for a significant fee. Then you don't see these players feature for a long time. Is that an indication then of he's no got a massive say in who's, who's coming at the football club? Yeah. Right, but listen. It's great we talk about Celtic Rangers because we never talk about them on the podcast. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, we need to move on, uh, on at Hearts. Who, let's get a round of applause to this man's form just now. <laughs> Dearie, mate, what a player, man. Some disgruntled applauses there, by the way. The only one that never clapped was the fucking Hearts fan at the front. 
Uh, Andy, what the best qualities you find in Robbie Nielsen as a manager other than being absolutely <laughs> fucking gorgeous? <laughs> his ability to play the sax, right? definitely. What? Uh, his ability to play the saxophone, definitely. <laughs> no, man manager, 100%. He's a good coach, which I think you need to be to be at, sort of at any level, at the, well, the highest level of the Scottish game. Uh, but for me, definitely his ability to treat individuals because... You look outside the old forum, very rarely the, the clubs the mess have big squads. I think you look at Hearts just now. We've I know we've got a decent sized squad for obviously uh, for for being in Europe this year. And you've got to have a special talent as a as a manager to be able to handle each individual player and keep them happy. And I think he does that really well. Uh, I think he's put a lot of trust in boys. I think if you look, I know our injury issues are obviously a big issue, but everyone's sort of had a chance. I think he's now, which I think has been a big thing for for Hearts fans, is he wants to see a bit more put. Uh, players getting chances for the academy. You look at Connor Smith and Finlay Pollock and you know, the likes of Aidan Denham, other boys have been on the bench. Scott Lewis Nielsen for Dundee United and, and, and he's made a few appearances this year. So It always seems to me, no matter what Robbie Nielsen does, as soon as Hearts hit one bad patch, there's calls for the ma- to, get rid of the, to get rid of the manager. Why, why, well, let's ask, why, why is that? I think it's just the concern is regarding big games. So often we seem to go to Glasgow in particular I know we've got Rangers on Wednesday night, so I might be tempting fate here. I do apologise. But I think more often than not, we end up getting our tummies tickled. I'd like to see us try and actually go. That's Lenny's favourite, Manny Joe. That's what I've just done to him for an hour up there. I think you got in the wrong place. <laughs> but it was an arse <laughs> 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 seal. But shit. I, I just feel as though it's like... A but should he be going and competing with these, with these teams? Well, probably not. But that's my biggest fear is that... It, it, turns into a Derek, a Derek McInnes tenure at Aberdeen, whereby... You is that, get a, bad, is that a bad thing when you look at Aberdeen if it is a Derek, Derek McInnes tenure? But then everybody at the club talks about ambition. Hearts are probably in the best place when it comes to like off the field as well as on the field for the best part of what, so, 20 So years? How, how did you do the last time that you forced Robin Nielsen it? <laughs> I, I mean, I didn't personally. The first tenure was great. What, was, what happened was, when he left? It was watching when you. you were second in the league, was it? Went second on the night. Right. Went against so what Rangers. happened when he left the last thing? Well, that's that's, that's what's amazing. Look, I, I've got no fans of Robin. and maybe you get relegated. <laughs> that's what happened. <laughs> <laughs> I've got no fans of Robin's first be tenure. Be careful what you whisper. Robin Nielsen's a top, top manager. It really is. And I know you're saying about going to Glasgow. Right, you got, you've got the option, you can finish outside the top six, but you win in Glasgow four times a season. No, I, I hear that. And look, it's more like he's never won an Edinburgh Derby at Easter Road. I just feel as though it's often overlooking the big Wait, How many he times has he finished below else. Hibs in the league? None. The other thing I would say for Robbie Nielsen as well is he's not only, he's not only successful at Hearts, but he's completely changed the style of play as well. I think no, that we, was another big we criticism do, we that do Hearts play, were born yeah. to watch. I yeah. now watch Hearts and I thoroughly enjoy it. It's attacking football on the front foot. And by the way, I know you've been put under a wee bit of pressure there, <laughs> but it is a minority of Hearts fans. I'm not saying that there's you know, 20,000 outside the gates all the time that's wanting them out, but it, there has been you no know, the odd mummer that but he's, he's not quite getting the credit he deserves. But when you're a manager, you take over a job. It's important you take the club and progress them from where they were before. I mean, he's came in when they're in the championship. Obviously, you know, he got them up, which everyone, you, know, you should do. That's what you should be expected to do. But the first time I asked him, he's got them third in the league. Two Scottish Cup finals in two years. You know, you're talking about beating Hibs at Easter Road. He's, he's took a team to beat Hibs in the semi-final twice in two years. But again, there always just seems to be these sort of question marks. And, you know, we're talking about Rangers and Celtic competing in the Champions League level. And going to Glasgow, you're talking about the same financial discrepancy. It's no easy. And higher, seasons, probably higher. It's higher, right? Yeah. And seasons like last year for me is why it is so big for the club that you then use that money wisely, which I think they've done this year. That yeah, was Lee McCulloch's teeth they got done with that money, wasn't it? got him new teeth in Turkey. My balance getting done in Turkey, so I mean, they've spent it brilliant. But Thanks for that. But you obviously, you use the money well. You, you, know, you improve areas of the club that needs improved. In terms of the playing squad, you make the squad bigger to deal with a European campaign. Not only that, you improve the, the players that have been at the squad. And then it's important that you try and maintain that sort of domestic form to finish in Europe every year where you can just continually chip away at the lead against Rangers and Celtic. So difficult. Nobody's under any illusions is very, very difficult. But that's the aim. That's what you're trying to do. Of and course. I think the way they've spent the money in the summer, I think that is where we're going to hopefully try and be. Surely there must come a point where you think, do you know what? If one of the old firm are misperforming, we've got a wee chance of sneaking in second. I think he said that this year, didn't he, at the start of the season? 
Mm-hmm. And it's great as, as fans, you want to hear that. Of course. He, he's talking about trying to close the gap and, and get as close to them as he can. And that's no lip service. That's genuine for the manager. I think the club as a whole has run brilliantly. They're, they're trying to get the group inside it. And they've changed, you know, going into the championship, winning the championship. You care because you go every week and you pay your money. But ultimately, it doesn't matter. Get out of the championship, get into the Premier League. And when they come up, to come up and go and finish third. Is, is, is ridiculous, really. Yeah, but so, fan, so that has to happen in an instant. Do you know what feels though? The cup final was a missed opportunity, though. Because oh, the Ellis the Ellis the chance doubt, in 10 minutes, and then for the rest of it, we were just uh, sitting back. Without, yeah. without doubt, I, I accept that, but that's at that what point I meant by the time, big games. I'm so the best about. you can get is third at that point in time. There's yeah. no doubt. That's the best you can get. And you, 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 the regret is you don't go and win the cup final, of course, but. It's just on the day, though, isn't it? Uh, of course. But, but they went had a go against Rangers the last game and they ended up getting beat quite comfortably. So it's hard to balance. Do you, exactly, it's a fine balance. But, uh, I mean, this is, this is obviously us from our point of view, how we want to maintain third. Hibs have went to Stanford in the summer. They're bringing in players. Aberdeen have spent fortunes for them as a club. They're paying fees for players. Dundee United have spent fortunes as well bringing in players. I, I mean, every club has the same sort of structure where they're trying to chip away at the gap and trying. You know, improve. It's, so it's listen. It's not easy. It's not easy to finish third. That, it's that's easy a, to get that's a compliment to Hearts, though, because yeah. Aberdeen, Hibs, Dundee United—they feel they have to spend to just try and catch. To catch Hearts. Yeah. The Hearts. They want yeah, to be that third point. place team, and Hearts are saying, right, we we have a a, a platform now to, to try and close the gap. Now, the the budgets for Aber, uh, Hearts to Aberdeen to Hibs are, are, will be very similar. To then go to, to Rangers and Celtic you're never going to bridge yeah, that yeah. gap in terms of budget and it would have to be a massive overachievement. So that's why I'm saying expectation and hope is great, but you need a bit of reality that you're saying you, you're hoping one of them has a really bad season and you can maybe finish third. I think Hearts at this point in time are in a great position to capitalise on that. that. I was actually going to concede that this season is probably more impressive for Robbie given the injuries that obviously we've attained to still be there or thereabouts heading into obviously the break and whatever. I know Robbie Nielsen gets a lot of credit, but Joe Savage as well. We're talking about Rangers recruitment, Hearts recruitment has been unbelievable. There's not really been a player that's came into the club that's no hit the ground running straight away. I think that's been uh, one of our definitely our main positives. I think a lot of players that have came in. You see, it's Anne, Anne Budge gives you a fitness test before she's, you sign that. She's outstanding, Anne Budge. She really is when she comes in for pre-season. What's she like, Anne Budge? Listen, you mentioned Derek McInnes. Derek McInnes would lose his best players at Aberdeen every year. And yeah. it was then his job to try and recruit somebody to be their next best player and keep them third in the league. And it's, again, we're talking about no being easy. That's, that's probably where Hearts have done really well because you're talking about Hearts' best players, your Barry McKay's, Kingsley's, Halkett's. They're all under three-year contracts. Bar Some, sure. Somebody want to come in and take them. They're not leaving for free transfers. Somebody's going to need to pay a fee for them. You're on a right few quid as well. I tell you you're what, you need to pay a fortune <laughs> to get me then. It's a gold <laughs> bonus as well at the minute, isn't it? That's, that's the way it is. So as a, as a whole, you've got to look at it and think, they're really well set up. They're not really, like I said, if somebody's going to come in and then take their best players, you're going to need to pay fees. They've got the majority of their, the nucleus of their squad are at a good age. We've, to be honest, in, in comparison to the rest of the squad, our squad's actually really young. Uh, in terms of our, our strength and depth, to where we are in the league now, consider, and I, and I say it, I, I'm big on it as a player, you don't make excuses and you don't, but let's be honest, your injury list is ridiculous. It's nothing I've ever seen before. I'm 31, I've played full-time football for 15 years. I've never seen an injury list like this in my life. And we, we've actually got a start in 11 that's in the treatment room that we've not had for two months. And for us to feel as if we've no been where we should be in fourth in the league with a game in hand to, to, to obviously get closer to third, then it's still been decent. But I, 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 I wouldn't goodness. be complaining about it if I was you. I I know, tell me, I'm, 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 I'm <laughs> reaping the benefits. But, I'll put, I'll, I'll, put that, I'll put this to the floor, right? Because I take criticism for this every year. But I, I, honestly, I truly believe it. I think right now, Scottish football is in a good place. In terms of teams in the league domestically, in terms of players, in terms of clubs. But I honestly that, think Andy, but look at the European performances with Motherwell and teams like terrible, that. Terrible. Terrible. But I'm saying domestically, I think teams, I, I, I think every team, not every team, right, but most teams have improved. Levy have got better this year. Aberdeen have got better. Hibs have got better. Brimhill. St. Mirren have got better. Have got better. Motherwell for me. Like, uh, I'd say Motherwell are the best team we've played at St. Rangers and Celtic. We've beat them twice. Uh, in terms of style of play. Uh, you don't need to rub play. it in. Come on. <laughs> I'll just go two goals. In, in, t- in terms of style of play, how they play, what Stevie Hamill's done in such a short period of time when none of his players 
Because one thing I say about Graham Alexander's mother well, and they done well, they got top six, they, they had a great run up, but style of play, you'd argue as a fan, you'd want a wee bit more. Stevie Hamill's changed that in a matter of two months. And maybe no quite got the results that they want, but you can clearly see a yeah. style of play. We're big on seeing a team's identity and in years gone past, do you see that in a lot of teams that say Dole Firm? Probably no. But I think you look at every team in Scottish football now, or most of them certainly, that there is. Right, Paul, we're on to Hibs. On to Hibs. This is a manager, by the way, I'm still no sure about. Lee Johnson, very up and down, isn't he? By I mean, the way, the Hibs fans coming for you, I can tell, man. <laughs> no, I'm, 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 I'm genuinely wanting to know because when they keep me Celtic parts, I know it's very hard, but they did look all over the place that day with their set-up. They have picked up a lot of uh, good results, but a lot of it is when teams have went down to 10 men. Um... I'm still unsure, Faddy. You know me. <laughs> but there, I would say there has been, there's definitely been an improvement yeah, in Hibs under Lee Johnson. There, there I don't think you can been. deny that. I think, I think clearly with you know, the results and performances, um, there's been an improvement. But there had to be an improvement because the last couple of seasons, last year, maybe has not been great for Hibs. And they didn't obviously finish anywhere near where they wanted to towards the end of the season. So there had to be an improvement. But he's yeah. also done this under a lot of injuries as well. We've said about Hearts' injuries. Hibs have had a hell of a lot of injuries to key players this season. Yeah, I think... Kevin Nisbet, Aidan McGeady, Martin Boyle now. But it's a new it's a new manager that wants to bring a different style. And every... every After the Celtic game, he spoke about mentality for the players. They're born with a fear of, of going and playing against Celtic and Rangers. And he needs to try and change that. Um, I think he questioned the mentality last week as well. So, I think it's... I mean... On the f- their, their league positions, okay. They would, would they would want to be better, but there's something that has to change for Hibs to get that consistency, which everybody's striving towards. We spoke about it earlier with Hearts. They've set the bar in terms of they finished way and above third. They were the third best team by a mile. So Hibs and Aberdeen, in particular, have had to up their game to get anywhere near them. It doesn't help that you know you're chasing your rivals, and the bragging rights added into that. Um, but I think there's been signs over the last the start of the season I, I must admit with the League Cup form you're thinking this is going to be mm. another one where there might be an early change um, but I think over the last few weeks he's, he's, he's managed to get performances they would want better results but performance levels have been there you go back to St Johnston dominated the game up until the, yeah, the half, you know, half time and then they, they lose the game so I think it's gone alright you, you can tell me, I, I, I've not watched Hibs obviously as much as you. I, I mean, I do like Lee Johnson, to be honest. I think he's, he's in a safe position in the sense that they'll stick with him for a bit longer because of what went before with Maloney. Obviously, that was a gamble. It didn't pay off and they changed quickly. But I think Johnson, he's got a way of playing. We, we have a lot of the ball in games. Um, I feel a bit sorry for him, to be honest. He's tearing his hair out because he's picking pretty similar lineups from week to week and getting completely contrasting results. I think we went the first we went first four games of the season or, or four out of five games without a win. We then won three in a row, four in a row, lost three in a row, beat off St Johnston, then showed up and won three and a half against St Mirren, and I went to Aberdeen on Friday and obviously got turned over four one. So I think the, the signs are there. I mean, we're, we're getting a lot of the ball, we're creating a lot of chances. Um, I think Nisbet being being out for for his whole tenure so far has been a huge one. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty positive that he comes back in the team. He'll score plenty of goals because we are creating. Um, but I just think he must be he must be so frustrated because, as I say, he's not changing the lineup too much. He's not changing the way we play too much. But from one week to the next, you're just never sure what type of team you're going to see. What have you made of the recruitment? Because obviously we spoke about that being a big thing in football clubs this uh, tonight. What, what have you made uh, of Hibs recruitment this year? Because they have went far and beyond. Are they Lee Johnson signings? Is there guys that are picking these players? Is that something that Hibs need to do better in terms of recruitment? It's been it's been disappointing to be honest. I mean, you look at the the number of players we signed in the summer, I think it was 14 signings, if you yeah. include the couple of boys that were that were on loan that went permanent. And if you look at the starting 11, there's probably three or four that are actually yeah. playing every week. So there's a load of boys that are getting getting contracts that aren't actually making the team better. I think Johnson said two or three times already that he's got too big a squad. And you're looking at guys that are just in the door in the summer that, that might be either going out on loan in January or, or going away permanently. So I think they've done that thing where it was a bit like Lennon at Celtic where they've gambled on a few unknowns, paid a wee bit of money for them, hoping that they'll come in um, make a name for themselves in Scotland and then bounce on and, and make a, a decent uh, return and transfer fee. But I think the majority of them, as I say, if you look at the starting 11, which has been pretty consistent over the season, there's probably three or four. David Marshall, the left-back, Cabraja, um, the boy Kenny in the midfield has been playing. Um, 
And then obviously they, they signed a the big boy up front on the on the last day of the transfer window, who's who's to be fair done, yeah. done a job. I think he's quite decent actually. Um and I'd I'd like to see him up front win this, but when he's fit. But as I say, fourteen players in the door, there's probably nine or ten there that, that actually didn't make us any better. So um, well, you, sorry, interrupt. Well, have you made a Hibs? Obviously, it's hard to be a Hearts fan, but you, you get to play against these teams. So, what have you made a Hibs this year in terms of playing wise? I I've certainly wasn't lying when I said I do think they've improved. Uh, I do agree with you that, and listen, it was probably the same last year where they had that obviously terrible run under Sean Maloney, but didn't have Nisbet. Obviously, lost Boyle in the uh, in the January transfer window. Never had Christian Dodge, who's it's three the main outlay in terms of goals. Uh, I think that is a big thing you're talking about them. Some of signings they've made, maybe not all of them have made the impact that, uh, that's required. I actually, I've watched the last few games, I do feel as if the big striker is Max Kukrachek. Yeah. Uh, saying his second name's difficult for anyone, but I think he, he seems like a really good sign. I think he gives them something different because I think without Nisbet, I think they, you're talking about adaptable and, and, and styles. I don't think Hibs style could ever be adaptable when, when Nisbet and Dodge were injured because they never really had that focal point up front. It was always... Whether it was Boyle, he's pacing behind, or Dodge coming on the last 15 minutes, be, you know, someone is a focal point, someone to hit. I think now with the big boy, uh, big Max up front, and, and to be fair, I think I think Yuan, you never mentioned Yuan. I'd, I've seen a bit of him this year and thought he was decent. I think he's another one that sort of falls into that category. But I think they've improved uh, in terms of consistency levels. It's probably no been where they want to be, but I think they'll be fine. Is Portis another one who's out of contract in the summer? Am I right in saying that? Would you cash, cash in on Portis now or would, would you, would you keep mean, him to the summer? I, I'm not convinced he'll sign, to be honest. I'd love him to stay. Um, I think he's, he's, he's improving every season. I think he's, he gets a bit of a bad rep, obviously, in the media. I'm not sure if, if he wants to stick around. I think he's probably had, probably had enough. Um, I think people that see him every week, see how much he's improved. He was one of our best players last season. He's, he's continuing to play every week. You forget he's only sort of 22, 23 year old. Um, he's obviously got that side in him where people pick up on the on the flashpoints or whatever. But if you look at his game over the course of a season, I think he doesn't get booked as much as people say he does. He doesn't get sent off very often. Um, he's really improved his, his play with the ball. You know, he's obviously he's known for his defending and his, his big tackles and headers. But I think he's a big part of the way that Johnson wants to play in terms of he's, he's decent on the ball. We build for Portrush. He actually he does quite a lot of work in possession as well as defensively. So um, I'm not convinced he'll stay, but. I think I would, I would really like him if he did. How high do you think he can go, Faddy? Obviously, you've played in South. Could he be an Aaron Hickey where he, he could end up in the Premier League one day? I think it's tough. You, you never know until they, till they go to that level. I would, I would suspect that Ryan Portis will probably go to the Championship before he goes to the Premiership. You know, you look at Scott McKenna and, and how he, he makes the move. Going to Nottingham Forest, then they get promoted. I think it'll be similar for Ryan Portis because... For some reason, teams were scared off of taking a punt on Scott McKenna. I think it'll be the same issue with, with Ryan Porteous. How much of that's on the players as well? Obviously, Hibs are going through streaks of wins and then streaks of losses. How much is it on the players, like say, Hanlon or whatever at Hibs that have been there for a long time, to go in and just grab him by the scruff, scruff of the neck and say, we need to snap out of this and sort of get a grip of the run of results that we're on? Well, the, I think it comes down to the player. You know, you look at the, the management side, the coaching side. If you're, if you're putting on giving them the same information day in, day out, the same sessions, you know, week in, week out. If it was as easy as, well, if we're doing this right and the preparation's right, the information's right, then the performances should be. But I think if you look at, you, you just, before that, going back a wee bit, you asked about Ryan Porteous, cutting out the silly mistakes, showing a bit of maturity, showing better ability on the ball. It just comes. And when you're trying to develop, particularly young players, you need to accept that they're going to make mistakes. Yeah. So if you're building a young squad, a young team, you need to accept that you're going to be up and down until you find that level of consistency. Now, that comes through the message for the manager, what he's telling the players every day. Andy spoke about uh, Robin Nielsen, man management, massive part of it, dealing with the, the person as well as the player. And it takes the, the players, taking on the information and the I'll look at it from a player's point of view. When I when I played, every day when I went in training, I wanted to be the best player in training every single day. I don't know if, I don't know how many players are like that now, but I wanted to be the best, and I wanted to be the best player that I could be, but also the best player on that pitch every day for people to say, "By the way, he's the best player." So it's about your your dedication, your drive as a player to be the best. And when you approach games, listen, it doesn't work. 
every week. Some some days you have bad games where no matter what you try, it doesn't come off. But I think it just needs a wee bit of patience to say, right, I trust the manager, the manager trusts the players, there's going to be ups and downs. The longer that process happens, the better chance you've got to success. If you keep changing it and saying, right, we need yeah. a new manager, we need a new style, we need new recruitment, we need to bring better players in, you're going to be in a cycle. Look, look at Hearts. For years and years, 10 players a transfer window, every single transfer window. No consistency, no style, no direction. Now they've got a manager that says, right, this is what I want. These are the players that I need. This is how I want to play. I want to go and challenge. I want to be better every single day. I want to improve. Then you get the rewards for it, but it just takes time. At the start of the season, I said Jack Ross was going to finish third with Dundee United. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to put this to you here. Do you think they were a wee bit too early sacking Jack Ross or were you happy that he was... That they sacked him when I they think, did? I don't know if you had the buy-in from the players. So on, on paper, Jack Ross, experienced manager, good mix in the squad, but it never really happened for mm. him but then we're now on to our fifth manager in three and a half years so arguably i guess you could argue both ways yeah maybe you should have been given a bit a bit more time but if the players weren't buying into him then did you, did you did you expect it to be more a plan in place for if jack ross was to go were you surprised that it was the guy that was standing next to him that eventually got the job yeah that's a surprise and i still don't think there's a plan in place and i don't necessarily see this manager sticking it out and not often that the coach becomes the manager and then stays on. So, nah, probably not. What, what, what do you think, Paddy? Was, was the 9-0 kind of, was that, is that a sackable offence? No, I think that what led up to that was that probably in, I think, you know, the Altmar result, lost the game 4-1 uh, in between that as well. I, I just think it looked like, when, when is that game developed, you're looking at it thinking you keep making the same mistakes within that game whether the players had, had gone whether the manager couldn't make a decision to change that I wouldn't say that game in isolation was enough to be sacked because if Celtic click I think they could do that in most teams in the league and I don't, I don't mean that disrespectfully I think that if they if you don't adjust to how they play they will exploit those that's what they try and do they try and exploit spaces and they try and punish you they don't stop Um but you just got that feeling that, <laughs> by the way, after the first game against Altmar, which was unbelievable, I bet you every, we, we were all excited for Jack Ross going into Dundee United. A good squad of players, well, well proven young Scottish manager with experience. You're thinking, right, he's got a real chance to, to put his stamp in this team and, and, and be up there challenging for the third, the third place he's getting into Europe. In the game, the first leg against Altmar, you're thinking, oh, wow, they've cracked it here. This is going to be amazing. The turnaround was, Absolutely incredible. Um, and I think that we, we always speculate on what, what we see, the same as fans at clubs, what we can see for the outside. You don't know what's happening behind the scenes. You don't know how the training is. You don't know how the players are responding. You don't know the conversations that's happening between chairman or, or board members, other staff members, players. We, we don't know what's happened, but they've obviously decided early to make that decision and We'll never know if that if that was the right decision or no. But the one thing is right. As soon as he was sacked, I thought I'm being honest, and I thought Foxy's going to get the job. I just I just felt it was let's go back to a similar type of an appointment to to Tam Courts and get a coach in that, that's maybe not proven as a manager um, that that can deal with the structure that's in place at the club. I, I thought Foxy was a stick on to get the job. And do you I think he's right from, then to take sorry. them forward, or do you think he's the right man to? I think it's tough because he's got a reputation as a good coach, but as you know, you've been a coach. When you're a manager, <laughs> when you're a coach, you can tell the manager what you think and you formulate your opinion and you back it up, but ultimately, it's an idea. The manager makes that decision. The manager that makes the decision lives and dies by that decision. So I think it's tough. It's different saying a manager come to you and saying, Right, we want to work on counter attack. How do how do we stop the counter? How do we how do we counter the counter and, and work on phases of play within a game of football? But a manager then makes a decision on as simple as starting the living. Then you go to your approach, your tactics to the game. I want to go and press this team, right? How do we press? 
What happens if the press doesn't work? How do we change our approach within that game? So many different things as a manager than, than as a coach when you're told, right, put a session on. It's, it's massively different. But the only way you can get that experience is by doing it. As I said, I wasn't surprised that Foxy was appointed. Am I right in saying that Dundee United went from kind of a low block, hard to beat team under Tam Courts to Jack Ross wanting to be a bit more front foot attacking football? I think it's fair. I think that was probably the main reason Dundee United finished top six last year was their defensive record. Defensive I think record, they yeah. conceded the fourth least goals in the league outside the top top three at the time, Rangers, Celtic and Hearts. So that was what their success was built, uh, built on. My thing with Jack Ross's team, because I've been pretty big on it in the podcast this season. When I seen Jack Ross the appointment, when I seen the squad of players that were bringing in, I was thinking, they'll be good this year. But that is a doubt mark game. I remember saying at the time is, that's the type of result that could mentally scar that team. Yeah. They might not mentally recover for that game. And then it, what led to that was the first game of the season at Kilmarnock. When you're 1-0 up, then you go down to 10 men, Kilmarnock score late on. One each disappointment, first game of the season. Then you lose the next game. Then you lose the next game, 1-0 at home to Livingston. And then, then the next game, 3-0 at home to St Mern. And then ultimately, what leads to a 9-0 against Celtic. And for me... You've got a season ticket at Dundee United. Oh, fucking hell. So, game, man. so up there, mate. That's unbelievable. So up there. But... Like I said, I feel as if he's a good manager. I feel as if they've got a good squad of players. But you talk about challenges as players and as men and as characters, they never recovered for that Outman game. But, so, but if he's going to try and change a full way of playing, he needs longer than fucking two months. Come on. 100%. Oh, he does. He does. 100%. Oh, look, we've seen it so many times with, with clubs all over the world that have managers that have... This is obviously not with Jack Ross because they never had success, but they had success, sustained success, but never felt as if they were improving much. So they got rid of him to change it and they just went down and down and down and down. And I'm not saying that's going to happen to Dundee United because for me, I've said it so many times, I think with the squad of players they've got, they, they can't go down. Mm. It'd be crazy if they went down. But with Jack Ross, like he says, they brought him in for a reason. So whatever his interview process, whatever he sold to the board and the club, how he wanted to change the philosophy, they bought into that idea. And you're talking about you know, man just needing time. Two months, man. But like, like, listen, they took obviously a, a lot of heavy defeats in that period, but he had to be given a bit more. But is that also a lack of planning for the board as well? Because when you think about it, if you, if you are going to go by Tam Courts type of a team and you're going to get rid of Tam, well, Tam Courts leaves, do you not bring in a, a similar type of manager who suits the, how their players play? Because Jack Ross sent us to go and play attacking football. We need a suspect. But, 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 but with Charlie but, Mulgrew and Ryan Edwards on the halfway line. But Fad, if you don't mind, that, that's what I want to ask the two Dundee United fans because I see this all the time. I'm talking about when teams have success. Surely top six was, was a big success last year considering coming up for the championship. But there was still always that disgruntlement with, with Tam Courts and what his team was yeah, doing. I think, again, Tam Courts, arguably the fans never bought into him. And it wasn't a good watch last year. They got results, 1-0. Mm. Yeah. But it was eight behind the ball, a couple up front, and they did nick 1-0s or get draws in certain games. So it wasn't enjoyable to watch those matches. And yeah, I don't Ta think the Tam fans... Tam sounded good for the people that won the Dundee United fans, didn't he? Yeah. Because usually we're at the games and see what, what's happening and, and Tam always put a, a great spin on it, which... Has ultimately resulted in but I think a decent move. Then top six, yeah, if we could, I'm listening to the Hearts fan, and if third, yeah, we would take top six. If you could do that every year in, year out, that's success for United as far as I'd be mm. concerned. It, it was very much reminiscent of Derek McInnes' Aberdeen for me, the full-time court situation and then getting rid of Derek McInnes because the style wasn't great, bringing in Stephen Glass who played good football but they couldn't win a game. Mm. But it seems as if it's the same and sometimes it's, it was, just, it was just top six. Scotland have never got a long-term plan of successive Aye. managers. I, I, but no, but it's not. I, I don't mind that if you want to change it to bring in a style of play. But two months, like, what's right. it going to do? But I, don't, I don't think anybody was critical with the appointment of Jack Ross. Mm. I know you're saying about you had this style, but it's all right saying right. We've got this style. Maybe the board, once Tam Court decides to leave, say right, we want to go down a different route. We we want a manager that's proven it, bringing through young players getting results. I, I don't think there was any, anybody that didn't think that Jack Ross Wasn't was a, good a brilliant appointment, appointment for Dundee United. The, the surprise was how, how quick they got rid of him. Are you happy about Liam Fox's appointment? No, nah, probably, well, pr slightly happier than Jack Ross, but I still don't think he's the long-term answer and there's a strong what chance to have a third Sorry. manager in the one season. What does the Liam Fox team look like? I obviously didn't get to see any. I only get to see the highlights. I still don't think he knows his 
best formation, best starting team. It's chopped and changed since he's been he's been in. And I think that's also a problem. If you're to ask most United fans or even the pundits, should probably end up with a mix of formations and a mix of different teams. So, so that's, that's a manager that, that probably alters as a, in accordance to the opposition. Opposition, yeah. So we're talking about build a style and stick to your principles and the arguments are always against that where or what happens when they do this or it's not working? So that's a, a young manager that's trying to is that find until he his finds style. His feet, Paddy? Is that until he finds his feet, maybe? Maybe. Maybe. I think maybe when, and you'll be able to answer this better than me, you overthink when yeah. you start and you second guess every single scenario, which is impossible. Mm-hmm. And maybe he's a wee bit guilty of doing that early on. Well, they go down, Dundee United. We'll ask the fans first. No. No. Based on what? Because of the quality of player? All right, Faddy? I agree. Slaney? I agree. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what we want to next? Have you just got a question for the panel, sorry? The mic's been taken off him. Talking shite. <laughs> <laughs> Why have you still holding one then? <laughs> it's just to change it slightly, this, what role do you think the senior players have in the squad? So we've got to me, good senior players, Mulgrew, Fletcher, Tony Watt, what role do they have to play when you're changing managers? Within, and it could be any, any club, but just uh, United. With just it, whether it's a change of manager or not, they have a massive role to play. And supporting the manager, if, he, if he's got a, a message, buying into that, like telling the younger players, listen, no, no, no stupidly or blindly, if you, if you convince the older players, the senior players, that what you're doing is right, they will help you to, to pass that message on. If you're putting on a training session, if you're putting on a tactical instruction, you need your senior players to buy in because if they don't, they'll tell the, the, the younger players, he doesn't know what he's talking about. This is rubbish. He's no, he's no the right guy. That filters down into the squad. And the senior players have a duty, I think, which, as you get older as a player, to pass on the, the knowledge, the, the, the standards that you set to younger players, regardless of whether you like the manager or not as well. Yeah. Jenny, about, you, I think it's all about passing the manager's message on, isn't it? But Jenny, can, can, exactly. Sorry, Sai. Sorry, twice mate, what, twice. what are you going to say? No, I was just going to say, Jenny, it can have the opposite effect though, senior players as well. Oh, definitely. If your senior players are, are don't follow your message, then I think you're fucked. Again, you see, I'll you give you a so example. Many times, I, I put under Jim McAnally to Fadi, right? Who, I didn't agree with the way Jim McAnally played football. I told Jim that, but what I would never do is go against his message to the players. Which I a lot of players exactly would do. Jim McAnally, what, is, what? Which a lot of players would do. Well, 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 players would do you yeah. see managers that go and they get rid of the older players straight away. Jim Goodwin. Because either they don't think they're going to buy in. Listen, sometimes it's because they just don't fancy them as players. But generally, it's I need to get rid of the people that can potentially influence the other players in the squad so that he can then control the message. By the way, we're on to Motherwell. This is your club. Yes. <laughs> been waiting for the I've been worried. I... That, this guy's been looking at me for the whole show. I don't know if he's going to come for me here. Looking at you, biting his lips. I've seen him. We gogsy, what a guy, fan. You spoke very highly of him. Mate, that's because it's like looking in the mirror. Fucking Slaney, stand up. <laughs> Slaney, let's see No, nah, he's a good looking boy, isn't he? He's a good looking boy, gogsy. Ah, you're no, thank boy. you. Thank you. No worries, mate. No worries. <laughs> Are you going to ask him a question or do you want, yeah? <laughs> oh, sorry, I thought you were going to ask the panel. I thought you were going to ask him. <laughs> Fuck me, I need to put half your date now. are you happy with Stevie Hamill getting put as the manager? I think I was content at, at the start because, of course, we crashed out to Sligo Rovers in Europe. Um, Thanks, my man. That's the his man. No, but... <laughs> <laughs> Aye, so we, we crashed out to Sligo in Europe. And I thought, well, we need to repair the damages as soon as possible. And Alexander walked. And the thing is, under Alexander, you said before, like we've obviously had a great start last season. And we were actually higher up in the league than we are now. However, we didn't have a proper game plan for most of the season. And it took till April to have an identical start in 11 to the previous game. So now we've got a proper identity in how we play. The only, the only stumbling block for us is the fact that we can't actually get a result. Like, yesterday, we, we played really well in the second half and we couldn't actually nail down a result. Um, there have been times 
earlier on in the season, like against Kilmarnock, we were 1-0 up and controlling the game and then through the game within the last 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And I think it's down to the lack of game management that we've got an inexperienced managerial staff. Uh, whereas I think under Alexander, from a winning position, we might have been able to keep a hold of a lead. So I don't know what my question would be, but how do you think Stevie Hamill can learn from the mistakes he's made so far this season? Yeah. Sorry, I think the big thing for Motherwell now is, is, is we're talking about managers coming in, new styles, change, takes time. He's working with players that have had Graham Alexander's message for over a year, 18 months, and it's completely different how Stevie Hamill's got this team playing. Completely different. And you're actually seeing players now that you maybe thought under Graham Alexander, are they good enough for Motherwell? Are they good? To me now, they actually look like better players, even though the results aren't actually quite matching how they're playing. So I think now... Stevie Hamill's came in, he's obviously sold the dream of changing attacking football philosophy. January's big for him because I yeah. think I think top six is really achievable for this Motherwell team. I really do. I, I touched on it earlier. In, in terms of teams we played, I think they're, they're right up there. But I think he needs a couple of players in certain areas of the pitch. I'm not going to say, I'm, and obviously I'm sure... Say no half. Him and, no, <laughs> somebody to mark somebody at corners. It's the end of. <laughs> but I'm sure you and obviously the Motherwell fans will, will, will see what they need to yeah. improve. But I, I definitely think if they get a couple of areas right, I, I think they'll be good. Is the, did he get Van Veen and Moult on the team Saturday? They came, they they came, came, came on, on the bench. Which, yeah. Is that something that he needs to do? Get a van, uh, well, get both of them in the same, t uh, same team at the same time? The problem is Louis Moult hasn't been fit enough to play a full 90 minutes. But when he came on after, unfortunately, we were 2-0 down at the time. So it was too high a mountain to climb to get back into the game properly. But Louis Moult and Kevin Van Veen up top look completely different to when we just had the one up top. Mm. Right, I, I agree, right? But So I'm talking about players that have improved and look really good just now. Yeah. Two big ones for me, Sean Goss and Callum Slattery. You go 4-4-2. Four, four, Does that suit them? That's not a midfield two pair, is it? Because they're both nice football players. Both doing really well under Stevie Hamill and the style they've got. But in terms of a 4-4-2, four, four, there needs to be a balance yeah. there. And I think you're then sacrificing something else to completely change, to get two up front. What about a 3-5-2 if you say they're struggling with their, their back two? 3-5-2. Essentially... I never said that. He did. <laughs> no, he said... Who did? You said centre-half. Did the centre-half? No, but no, I... Huh. Essentially, we need. <laughs> <laughs> Essentially, what we're needing is like a bit of a shit house player, someone that can actually come in, like a Jim Goodwin, Keith Lasley, or Bob Malcolm. That can Steve actually. Kagan. But, yeah, but, but that, that's Kelly the Toe. problem, but, You don't. You don't have. You talk about game management now. Mm -hmm. If after Sligo and away, yeah, and all the Motherwell fans could see it last season. Although I think Graham Alexander, when he took over, to where he took the club over to where he left them were in a far better position absolutely and they improved the club finished fifth got them into Europe but last year watching the games crying out for wingers crying out for wood played the narrow three strikers it wasn't working no. and the, the change was to change the three strikers to change the three midfielders the team changed every single week so I'm looking at that thinking right the new manager that comes in still needs wingers still needs wood but he's not got them. The problem so is, Stevie doesn't have them. Yeah. So Connor Seals is playing as a right winger. Mm -hmm. Blair Spittle's playing as, as a left winger, which is his position. But mm -hmm. you talk about game management. So what do you change? Because you don't have a squad that's able to, to change in-game as much because he's getting the most they can get out of the starting 11 through not having the players that he's, he's brought into that squad. I think we need some leaders in the team. Like, for example... Under Stephen Robinson, we had the likes of Peter Hartley who could lead the team and completely lead from the back. But at the moment, I, I look at the team, we've got good players, but we don't have someone that can actually lead off the ball, in my opinion. But, but he's not had time to build a squad. No, he's not. He, so, he had like two weeks before the transfer aye, window. So, so. so I, I would imagine that's been identified because with the biggest respect to, to Andy, he scores last week against Ross County with Heather. Mm -hmm. He's telling his set piece, the, the assistant manager, get me in the box, I'm good at set plays. Mm -hmm. he, he dominates Muddle's two centre-backs to win the ball. Mm -hmm. He comes off the back, by the way, your header yesterday was a better one than last week. Agreed. He comes off the back, he, one of them, knows he's taking a hit off the other one, but still gets his head in the ball. That's your two leaders. But he needs, he needs time, he needs time to yeah, bring his own players in. He, he definitely does. Uh, so top six realistic for Motherwell this year? 
I would say so. I mean, it's a tight enough league as it is. It just takes a couple of results to get us back up there. It's just getting the results right. is the problem. Right, lads, we're on to Kilmarnock. Uh, Derek McInnes is viewed as a brilliant appointment by Kelly while they're in the championship. We're joined by Lachlan Higgett. Hyatt. What a name that is, Hyatt. A co-founder of Ayrshire Football. Has Derek McInnes lived up to your expectations? Aye, absolutely. He's doing a, doing a <laughs> very good job, I would say. Aye, he's, he's come in, he's, he's turned it around. You know, the team are struggling, especially at home yeah. in the championship. But, but since then, he's turned that around. Away from home, no so great this season. But he, he's definitely turned things around. And I think everybody expected that when he came in. But he's, he's doing a good job. <laughs> would, you, would you just go along with this? I was actually surprised that Kilmarnock managed to get Derek McInnes. Well, I was just about to ask Lachlan that. Do you worry that he'll be taken away from Kilmarnock? Um, maybe slightly a few weeks ago, um, but he signed a, a longer deal now. You know, the, the worry was his deal was up at the end of the season. But I think he's bought into the project a bit, you know. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a word that gets banded about, but that's, that seems to be what he wants. He wants, he done it at Aberdeen, he was there for a while, you know. That's obviously his style, building it up and, and turning teams around. But again, this, this is where you need to feel sorry for managers because I felt like Derek McInnes was, was really getting somewhere with Kilmarnock. A big part of that was Big Lafferty. I know we didn't want cheers or cheers, but you then go and lose probably your best player for a 10-game ban that's out with your control. And, and, and then you might need to go and change your style again because you've now no got that big centre forward till, till January. And that's the big reason that I, I put them as my dark horse this year, Kilmarnock. And that was a big reason for it. It's because I looked at the strikers they had at the club and I thought they've got three strikers that can get you goals. Yeah. Whether they're on form, out of form, rotating within the squad. They probably eat, None of them have really hit the form that they're, they're capable of. Obviously, you're, you're quite right in saying the big thing Derek McKinnon has brought to the team last year was that stability, home form, the, the home record they had there moving forward. But one point away from home this year. So it's you know try to find that balance is what they're doing at home suiting how they approach the game away from home. You know you look at that Livingston game. I think the way Kilmarnock play, the way Derek McInnes uh, team has uh, has his team set up. Sorry, when you take leads in games, especially a Derek McInnes team, you never fancy them to lose. Mm. They might you know they might go for a one 0 to a one each and a draw, but you never never fancy them to lose. So I think for me, I did tip them to be a dark horse. I do think that Kyle Laffey missing for ten games, Ollie Shaw finding form. No strikers is, is maybe something that's a, a problematic area just now. The two big positives for I seen when they signed Jordan Jones back, I thought that's a massive signing for them because I've, I've played with JJ obviously at St. Mirren last year. He, he was great for the last six months of the season. I thought it was going to be a big signing. But then Armstrong in the other wing, you can argue he's probably been Commander's best player this season. So I think they've got two players there that can be match winners for them. But see to say, just that focal point up the pitch to try and get them goals in, in key games. That is the thing with Derek McInnes, he does make players better. 100%, even he made us better, didn't he, when he spoke to us? Didn't yeah. he? He felt brilliant, he helped you as well, Sai, with the management. In January, would you bring a striker in? Aye, I, th I think you've got to. The thing is with Kelly's strikers, they've not got much different at the moment. You know, you've got Lafferty, a Doidge, you know, aye. Shaw. Like for like. I, like for like, aye. I, I think McInnes did try and bring something a bit different, um, but... <laughs> thing is you've got Scott Robinson who's been out for a year he's a player that is different you know he's a bit nippier but he's been out for McInnes' first game in January you know it's but I think I think so they need to bring something a bit different but I, th I think that is Derek McInnes' style the big striker and if you think about his Aberdeen teams like you said Armstrong White Adam players, Rooney Cosgrove Adam Rooney Cosgrove so I, I think I like, it'll be I like, a similar type that comes in I like Cameron I think he's I Who's that, sorry, Faddy? Ennis Cameron. Cameron. Ennis Cameron Honestly, I think that if he's worked on, he could become a, a big player for Command. I'm a big fan of Ennis Cameron. I know, I would agree. I think he's a kind of similar mould to likes of Cosgrove. You know, he's a bit raw. Aye. But with that work, as you say, you know, he can be a big player. It's maybe not went how he'd liked over the years at Kelly. He's been out in loan. He's, he's done all right out in loan when he's went. Am but I, this is his chance to possibly have that run, you know. Am I right in saying, lot when that Ash Taylor's Commander's top goal scorer this year? I think Armstrong will have overtaken him so now. Armstrong just overtook him, but you're looking at Armstrong, like I said, who's probably been the player of the year this year, four or five goals, Ash Taylor, three or four. So, I mean, clearly that's obviously an issue and a big part of the reason we're coming out where they are, but you know, we've just named four strikers yeah. that are good SPL strikers, given their day, Ennis Cameron, Ola Shaw, Christian Doidge, Kyle Lafferty, but you know, you need one or two of them to hit the form they're capable of to obviously get out of the position they're in just now. Is safety the priority for coming up? Would that be a successful season safety this year? I, th I think so. It's maybe a bit negative, you know. You, you want to look up, but I think building that foundation of staying in the league, and then McInnes, he's brought in, you know, the head of recruitment, Russ Richardson. 
he's now got time to work, you know, like it's a January, you start looking ahead and you need to stay in the league first and foremost to, to build on that. So I, I think so, in a way, it's a, the minimum, you know. In fact, are we looking at Ross County, Kelly and United? Fight a three? I, I think it's so tight. I really do. I think, you know, Andy mentioned the point earlier that the league's stronger. I really believe that it is stronger. Um, and but I think, you know, some teams you go, look, they've had a great season and there's still no, there's still no team that's, that's cut adrift. Um, I think it's going to be really competitive again this year. I think it's going to go to the end. Ross County getting a win at the weekend. Everybody keeps saying, oh, Ross County were the same position last year. Um, but it's easier said than done. Managed to get their, their win. Could have lost that game Saturday as well. Easily. Night. But yeah. that's that's the way the league is. And, and you know, we're talking about Kilmarnock. The goals they lost were, were terrible. Yeah. You know, the, the goal, the last goal, the own goal, another 10 times out of 10, that's impossible. You can't do that even if you try. So that's how tight the league is. And I think it will go right to, right to the end. All right. We're on uh, your team, Paul Livingston. His horn keeps disappearing oh, up there. Got, sorry, have you got a question, uh, Lachlan? Uh, I, uh, we can't kind of speak about Kelly and no discuss uh, plastic pitches. So I was wanting to kind of get your view, Sai, as a, a gaffer and Andy and Faddy as experienced players. You can... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and and, and uh, Slaney is a three-piece suite. <laughs> <laughs> you, can, uh, you can set this one out, Slaney, you're all right. <laughs> um, no, but I just wanted to speak about, you know, the, the AstroTurf. Kelly, great home form this season. You know, the only team, Celtics beat them, and the only other team is Livingston, who obviously play in pass, uh, plastic. But away from home, scored one goal, one point. How big do you think the, that aspect is, the plastic pitch? Uh, I just say your best performance in Amsterdam. What, what were you playing on concrete? <laughs> <laughs> I'm raging about it. <laughs> uh, no, I really like the AstroTurf. I like the AstroTurf because we train on it two nights a week. I think that's a massive advantage. I think most of the boys uh, who play on grass will train on grass. Uh, and having had that at Peterhead where we trained on grass, and then when you did go to an Astro Turf pitch, especially maybe in 34, 35, my, I, I will be honest, my back, my joints were fucked for... I, I, I'm still talking the next Saturday, you're going to play and you didn't feel as good as you did uh, previously. So I do think it's a massive advantage. I love it for how we want to play. Um, my favourite away day was Clyde when I was at Peterhead because we kind of came into a team that wanted to pass the ball. Um, and I think if you want to do that in terms of um, playing out through the back, um, playing high and wide with your wingers, playing through the lines, um, I'd, I'd much prefer an Astro over a, a bobbly grass pitch in December in Scotland every day. Um, I don't know what you guys think on that. I hate it. No, I absolutely hate it. Uh, always have, always will. Um, I think at the top level of the game, in my opinion, I don't think it should be allowed. I can understand why it is, because, you know, come on, let me say make money off it. So if, if you're going to change it, SFA, for me, are the ones that need to step in and, and, and make it a rule, give them money to re, uh, relay the pitch or whatever it is. But, you know, my big thing is, you know, when it's pissing a rain, that's just decent. You know, you can play yeah, football. Yeah, yeah. And get it on about, that point, the SFA shouldn't need to step in. Motherwell, for years, was the worst pitch in the league by a distance. So would you rather play on that but, than an Astro? That? No, uh -huh. but look at it now. It's yeah. the best pitch in the league because they've, they've put investment in to make it the best. I don't think people should step in. I think the club should have a responsibility to make it. No, no I, I get that, but you, it's because obviously Kilmarnock and Livingston are so community-based. They've obviously got academies training so on it. Right? They rent it out. So they rent it out. They make fortunes on it, am I right in saying? With the, with Aye, the, so they should have to dig into the rain pocket and get it themselves. They should sell be getting any help. Sell Nubly, sell all the Did you hate it as well, Faddy? Did you hate it? I don't like, I don't like, uh, for top flight football, it should not be on AstroTurf. I don't no, care I'm what anybody says. top flight, shouldn't I? <laughs> but I'll give you the side as a player because I've finished my career at Queen of the South. Hopefully there's no Queen of the South fans and <laughs> I was hopeless. Um, I trained on it every day and when we played home games, it was great. But heard. see, your point, see going for AstroTurf every day to grass, Wow. Do you think that's why they may be the away record, isn't Aye. it? Of course yeah. it is. Kyle Lafferty doesn't play well on grass. I know. <laughs> because he's just the arse <laughs> tough. And when you get older, it takes many a load on your joints, joints. your calves as you get older. Aye. And you struggle to go for the arse tough to grass. Harder or probably more than what you would for going for grass to arse tough for one game. I know McInnes, he tries to counter that. Yeah, when they're setting up for an away game, they, they go and train on grass maybe a couple of days a week. But as you say, you're switching and Changing to just get a grass pitch and we'll not have this conversation. <laughs> Paul, you fun? Not at all. 
You need to put them up. Sorry, Si. Do you need an R red wine? I, I don't know what's happening with that. No, by the way, not at all, Si. Genuinely, when I was at Fistle and Lone, I know the big man's no interest in my career, but we'll sort that out after the show. Do you have a <laughs> career? <laughs> no, but Si, see, when I was at Fistle, I genuinely just turned around and my hip completely shattered when I saw that when it happened in grass, so I don't think it should be used, especially with fantasies. No, just in the top league, in any league. But listen, let's not be negative. A very positive team and manager in this country, David Martindale. Big boy, you must be absolutely buzzing. He's your manager. Who have I got? We've got... McLovin. <laughs> McLovin. McLovin. <laughs> <laughs> Can you stand up and show the crowd? That's a joke. I've, I've got a wee bit of McLovin Rubbish. about moving. Uh, no, it's class. He is honestly just fucking amazing. Like, what's, his, I love him. what's his connection with, like, with the fans? Like, is he, what, do you know him, does he speak to you personally? It seems yeah, like no, that. I, no, we've had him on uh, on our podcast and he's he's brilliant, man. Like he, He's just bought into Livingston. Um, he grew up in Livingston. So he's obviously got like an attachment to the town. Um, obviously, it's sort of well known that he's a big Rangers supporter, but like he's always said that you know, Livingston is his sort of team. Like, and that that's the thing. It's just been a breath of fresh air. We've had so many managers over the years that have just come in and out and just not really cared, like, about the team and they've just sort of left us in the dark. But, no, nah, like, he's one that he will put the team first ahead of himself and it's the first time that I've ever seen it as a Livy fan. What do they like, what do they like to play against, Andy? So difficult. Uh, whether people use that as a negative against them or no, it doesn't matter because it's so successful uh, and... The sort of consistency levels you've got at Livingston now is when was the last time Livingston were doing a sort of relegation battle? It's been about three seasons now. The progression they've had under under David Martindale, and they're another one for 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 me. They're always in danger of losing so many players every season. Seems as if they've, they've always got that constant turnover. Where no, they're got they're, they're top they're a top flight team. They're going into pre-season with like nine trialists because their budget's no high. They're losing that many players in the summer, and they always seem to find these players out of nowhere. Right. I mean, you're Christian Montano's uh, the the boy that played last week on the wing. Sorry, what's his name again? Dylan Bahambula. Dylan Bahambula. Like the, these players that are finding it out of nowhere, it's just got to give them so much credit for it. And for me, it's you know, you were talking about Ash, and we don't like it. We don't, but they use it to their benefit because it's such a difficult place to go but, living. But Andy, I, I played against Livingston in the championship when they didn't have Ash, they had a brilliant grass part. They were still horrible to play That's against. That's when I was there as well. <laughs> they, they were still a tough game. They still, they still ran. They still fought. They, they hooked it when it had to be hooked. They still, the, the, the good wee players run about the box that, that cause you problems. They, they use it to their advantage, but it's no the reason why they're as successful. You spoke about it. You don't enjoy playing against them because they work so hard. The players that he brings in, Jet before he goes to Aberdeen, know the Jet that was at Aberdeen, the Jet that was at Livingston, hard working buying into what the club wants. Nubly, who'll be the next one to move on. Hard working, buying into what the club wants. Every yeah. single player, if they don't reach the levels of, of commitment and work rate, they don't play. I see, it's, not, it's not like he's just buying hard workers. He's buying flair players and he's getting he's, them that's what, I was going to, hard. that's what I was going to say, Faddy, because see if you look, see for me right now, Joe Nubly's form like, is up there with anyone outside the old firm uh, uh, right. and even including the old firm. Look at, go on Wikipedia, Joe Nubly. Uh, he said about 25 clubs <laughs> in his what, mid-20s. Yeah. Mate, can so I, can I he ask why, get... you're, why you're Wikipedia and Joe Nubly? Because uh, I'll tell you exactly why. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll be impressed if you can list them. Uh, no, listen, no. Slaney definitely, no. definitely knows. Was, he's going to tell you if you're like or not. But I'll tell you why. Because see, after the Rangers game, I thought, somebody's signing him. Generally, I did. Because that's twice now I've seen him absolutely ragdoll Rangers. The, the uh, and play unbelievable in both games. And I, I deliberately went on because I was like, how old is he? Because somebody's going to go and sign him. And then you look at it, you look at the list of clubs where clearly he's not been successful. Yeah. But that's what you talk about the influence of manager. Because obviously David Martindale has brought him in, realised he's top level and no accepted what he brings. And By the way, he sent him on loan to Abroath when he signed him. Sorry? Sent him on loan to Abroath when he signed him. So he's probably thought, I'll send it to Dick. So see when he comes back for Dick Campbell, he'll think I'm... Br- <laughs> and then they, I'm nice and soft. And, and, then they thought, and then they thought, do you know what? We'll do it again with Hamilton. We'll send him to Abroath and do the same. Then he's scored a lot of goals and all. So. Yeah. Could he play with Selica like Rangers, Snoopy? <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, that's a good question, huh? Mate, what is it? No, Could he play with Celtic and Rangers? No. no. I'd see him at an Aberdeen, Hearts, Hibs level. I don't know he can... The, the, only, like the only thing he's got against them... And I love him a bit. He scored two goals against Rangers this season. Um, one goal against Hibs. But 
the amount of chances he has. The amount yeah. of chances that he creates himself, brilliant. He's got quick feet. Um, he'll skin, you know, three, four players and then he'll sky it for two yards out. Like, the only thing that goes against him is the fact that he's just not consistently scoring, um, which is something that Livy have always sort of really struggled with since we've been back um, in the top league. But, yeah, that's the only... If he could score... I, I think he could play for him. Am I he right made, saying he made still a great got, point. Martin Stale still got players that Livingston had in League One, so Scott Pittman would be one? Um, yeah, Scott, I think Scott Pittman might be the only one. Uh, Jackson Longridge as well. Jackson Longridge. Yeah. Um, but Pittman, man, he's, he's I love just... Scott Pittman. Aye, just amazing. Like. But see, see the point on Newboy? You've just says he creates a lot on his end mm. and he, he's wasteful with the chances that he almost creates for himself. If he played for... I don't mean to disrespect you. A team that creates more opportunities where it's no so reliant on yeah. a striker that has to run channels, lead the line, hold it up, link it, dribble and beat three or four men, then he might be that guy that scores because his goal against Hibs in particular was yeah, nice yeah. composed finish. Rangers as well on the half turn. Strikers type of goal. So maybe if he was in a team that, that was maybe not focused so much on the other parts that he needs to bring to the team, and he can be a, an actual striker that leads the line and, and maybe his chances are created for him. Maybe he could. Will and he I, ever leave Livingston? There's a question for you. Who? Davey Martin. I, I, I'm not just saying this because I, t- I say it all the time. He's my favourite manager. Because I love listening to his interviews. I love how honest he is. There's no ne, yeah, ne black or white or grey. Or it's just complete truth. And I'm already surprised that nobody's been linked to him. He's been linked to nobody. I think he was, on, he was on the radio at the weekend. He says he's had an opportunity to go to another team in Scotland. Uh, maybe two teams in Scotland, one in England. He's linked to Fleetwood. Yeah, he's, he's, Fleetwood. Yeah, he says that he's not going anywhere as, else in Scotland, does he? As long as Livingston want him, he'll be the manager. I'd be amazed if he went anywhere else in Scotland. Because what he's got at Livy, you're talking about the adulation that the fans have got for him. But yeah. on touch on what you were saying about Newbury, I mean, obviously you are Livingston and you are, you know, oh, well, there you go, Slaney. Down, down, down that, Slaney. And cup. you are that team where you're hard to beat. Half cups, aye. We've, we've got a game tomorrow. We've measure. got a game tomorrow. What are you up to? <laughs> There's a couple of classes in that. Some, <laughs> that that Slaney comeback with some half on it. That looks like Richard Goff when he was a Livingston manager with that suit on. He's <laughs> dressed as a couch. <laughs> Has Liam got a question? You got a question, big boy? Uh, to be honest, my, my question was going to be like, did you ever think that Martindale would go in particular to another Scottish team? But um, just mainly for you, Andy, because you're sort of playing against the team. Sick, like, it, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely legend, man. Um, is there any sort of player for Livingston that you think is completely underrated? Like, cause J- we see Jason Hope. Week- Aye, Jason Holt. Okay, Hands thank down. you. <laughs> and, uh, you can't pick your mate. No, pick somebody else. Go on, say, it's, Jason Holt getting a clap. It's, 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 <laughs> it's no because he's my mate. It's no generally, isn't he? But he is. He's, he's, he's the one in Livingston's team. That you're talking about hard work and, and being leaders. And uh, See, because he's stature doesn't mean he's a leader. He is somebody that trains that like he wants to win every single day. Faddy talked about it earlier when he was a player. He wanted to be the best player in training every day. Jason Holt is that mentality. And I, you know, I've spoke to Marvin Bartley a couple of times and, and he, he always says to me that you take Jason Holt out of our team, you're not the same team. Yeah. And you, know, you compliment him with a Scott Pittman who likes to get forward a bit more and, and boys like that, then for me, he is the main one. Jason Slaney, one of them, wait a minute, Slaney can join in with this one. Go. Is Nicky Devlin the best captain Livingston's ever had? Oh man, he's certainly up there. Like, he has. Did, is, did the fans love him? Aye, aye. He's honestly, he's been brilliant. Again, just... I think, like, for so many years, and Andy will probably know, because he was at Livy when we were at our fucking lowest, like, um, every every player has just bought into Livingston recently. And I think a massive part of that is to do with Martindale. It's certainly not the thousands of supporters that we've got. It's, it's because they they see this guy who's passionate about the club, and I think they buy into him more than... Well, when they buy into him, they buy into the club as well. Does you know uh, deserve a, a, an opportunity, a big job, what he's done there? I think he does. Am I, am I wrong in saying this? So if I'm asking a Hibs fan, Hearts fan, an Aberdeen fan, Dundee United even, if Davy Martindale got your job tomorrow, I think I feel like fans would be a wee bit underwhelmed. Am I, am I right in saying that? That's he knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing. He can, well, he can see by the faces he would be underwhelmed, <laughs> did you? Is it because uh-huh. he, is, is it because he how, is it because of how he sounds when he speaks? I always get that feeling from though that Aye. anywhere else would. He doesn't get the credit he deserves. Definitely doesn't he? No doubt about it. The, I agree with you wholeheartedly, I think, because it's David Martindale. Obviously, there's there's baggage that comes with him. 
you know, for his past. And because I, I think there is a snobbery about how he sounds when he speaks. I really do. But when you listen to what he actually says, we we'll mention it. He's honest. He calls a game exactly how it happens. He, he tells you how he wants his team to play. If they've done well, he'll praise them. If they've not done well, he'll come out and say it's not good enough. If there's a referee's mistake or whatever. I think he's always very honest, but I think it's because it's David Martindale and it's no some exotic name that excites the fans. It would, I tell you what, it would be weird if David Martindale one day came out in an interview and went a couple of games, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't be having that by the way, I know where. Right, we're on to St. Murn. Sorry, we left you to laugh, mate. Um, we've actually got a text message in from a St. Murn fan, Stephen Thompson. How do you read off an autocue? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if any of you... Was it spelt right, <laughs> aye? Uh, so we've got Davey Irvin, sports journalist for the Glasgow Times. Davey, what's your question for the panel? Uh, I think the question would have to be kind of about Stephen Robinson. He's obviously come in. It's been a bit up and down. Third top if you look at home form. Second bottom if you look at away form. What is the kind of peak for Stephen Robinson and what, from an outsider's perspective, would be a successful season for St Man? I'll go for uh, a top successful six. season, top six. No? Top six. Yeah, would you be happy with that or do you see higher? Yeah, no, no, no. I see top six would be a, a great success because the last few seasons, I think it's been close, but it's just never been getting over that line. But I think with Stephen Robinson, there seems to be a, an idea that he's sticking with. I just don't know if he maybe needs to adapt a little bit more away from home when it comes to, you know, when teams want to come and play against you. When we played against Celtic, you see that, they did really well. They were right up for the game. It just seems to be getting to that level every single week. It doesn't seem to be achievable at the moment. Well, he'd he done it with Motherwell, though, didn't he? He was maybe a similar situation. He was in at St. Murn for the first season. And then after that, was it third he finished with Motherwell? Am I right uh, saying that? Got them in Europe, didn't aye, he? Yeah. Aye, aye. So aye, long term, I think two, he could eventually get some money. Because he's, he's, from what I hear, very good coach. Aye, I, I've, I've worked with, with Steve and I think that it, it, it's weird because you're asking what's a successful season, but many people tipped St. Martin to be down the bottom. Many people tipped Steve Robinson to be the first manager to leave. Um, and after the League Cup campaign, it probably uh, looked as if it was The League Cup campaign was poor. So <laughs> it's amazing how we're speaking about how you expect the highs for managers, but going into this season, what, what did you, after the, the, the end of last season, Jim Goodman was on a good run. Then he comes in, Stephen Robinson goes on a terrible run, you've got the League Cup campaign. What was your expectation before a ball was kicked this season? I think after the League Cup campaign, you're looking at it in the sense of it is just survival is the first kind of hurdle. Um, before the, the League, Cup, uh, League Cup campaign, a lot of fans were looking at top six as a, a realistic thing. There was a sticky patch last season, but it, it kind of came through it. But I think the, the League Cup campaign really did kind of put serious concern in. And I think until really um, it was Keanu Bacchus got his visa cleared and came into the squad, that seemed to really lift the team and he's kind of become a key player in recent weeks. So I think a, a sense of it is also the recruitment that he's done and once those players are bedded in, it really has looked like it's now looking up the way rather than worrying about what's down below us. I think the, the way that he wants to play, you can see the profile of the player he wants. He wants athletic players, he wants to be a tough team to play against. And I think when you're at home, you can... Well, listen, I don't, I don't know the reason why. Because you would expect the way they want to play, it would suit better to be away from home, actually, now thinking about it. So I, I don't know why. He came out yesterday or the other day and says they don't line up or set up any different. They don't approach any game any different. It just seems to be that they have you know, a, a better record at home. So... Gonfe and Gogze might be able to, to jump in on this. With, with Motherwell, the results weren't they consistent because in order for them to get results, they had to beat their absolute best in terms of their effort, their commitment, the non-negotiables, he calls it. So they have to be fighting and scrapping and, and, and in your faces and, and, and a physical side and a hard team to play against. And when that didn't happen, when that dropped slightly, invariably they lost games. So... It's very difficult to get that consistency when your main aim is to get it forward, win second balls, fight and scrap, make it difficult. And, and sometimes you're nicking games based on percentages. 
but to get that level of consistency, that level of performance, to ask your players to be physically at their best every single game is impossible. And then you also get success, but when you have a, a maverick like David Turnbull and amongst that, whereas he doesn't have that at St. Man. He doesn't have that but, one player. But that, that, came a bit, that came in the evolution of his style. Right. Initially, it was get it forward, two strikers up front, 3-5-2, get it forward, scrap, fight, big physical players. David Turnbull emerged. Uh, Alan Campbell came into the team, Jake Casty. Um, who, who else? Aye, but he was he was towards it. Anyway, David Tumble comes in and you think <laughs> Aye, he, he was he was later. David Tumble comes in and you need to find a way to play this boy because he wants a ball. He wants to score goals. He wants to play a different way that you're used to playing. Mm. And that evolution happened because that style and system had ran its course. You had to change it. And David Tumble came to the fore and was absolutely outstanding. I've watched some on maybe four or five times Max this year, but every time I've watched him back, he's been the best player. I think he's been a massive signing for them because it's that destroyer in the middle of the pitch, wins it back, does his job really well. And similar to what I said about Kilmarnock earlier, the reason why I think St. Mern will do well is I look at Kilmarnock, I talked about the strikers they've got. You look at St. Mern, a young guy who for me is very good. Yeah. Curtis Main, who's improved this year. Alex Grieve, Eamon Brophy. Again, you've got four really good strikers at this level that on a day will we'll score you double digit goals. And then you talk about your experience, Declan Gallagher, Mark O'Hara, great signings as well. Not just on the pitch, but the dressing room setting standards. Right, and that, that's what you need. And that's the, the players that have worked with the manager before. Yeah. So was, you, you meant, somebody asked a question earlier about the, bring the experience. How do you deal with experienced players? Well, what you do is you, you, you either influence the players that are there or you bring in players that are big characters and leaders into the dressing room to say, by the way, this guy knows what he's talking about. Listen to him. You might not enjoy it. You, there might be times you question it. Listen to this guy. He knows what he's doing. And that's what he's done. You always talk, I always talk about recruitment. You can have the best ideas, the best plans, the best style. If you've not got the players to do it, to buy into it, no, no ability. If they, don't buy, if they don't believe what you're telling them, you're not going to get success. So bring in people that you've worked with. You know what they can do. They know what you can do. They know, you know they'll buy into your style. You know they'll have an influence on the players run about them. They will get them to help you with your message and get it across, and that's what he's done. You said that happened with Snoddy and Naismith at Scotland. That was right. Uh, that, honestly, and obviously it's different with, with international football, but when you've got exceptional professionals, they raise a level. And it's no that, maybe no, it's different with international because you've no got enough time to influence your style and, and how you want to play and your approach. But the, the noticeable difference with Snoddy and, and, and Nasey coming into the top, the team and the squad was incredible. We, we've all seen Stephen A. Smith, money bastard on the pitch, right? He's a money bastard on the training pitch as well because he demands a standard, he demands a level. And if you, if you don't reach it, then he'll let you know. And it drags the standard up. Snod, him and Snoddy, when they came into the Scotland setup, the training went for there, he, he there, and that's because of how they do things. The demands they put on themselves, the professionalism, but also the, the demands they put on others. Would they ever challenge a manager? Um, I, I would imagine in certain circumstances, I, I think they would. Do you, I think that, do you think that's good? It depends on... How they're doing it. How they do it. It depends on what they're doing and how they do it, how, how confident the manager is, but you need you need voices like yeah. as a manager you look to your staff and you want your staff to challenge you if you're doing something and a staff member recognizes it's maybe wrong or or may, maybe wants you to have to think about something else do you have to challenge you now you have it out and then you, you argue the point likewise if you tell if you if you think you're sending a great message and the, the experienced players don't agree well I would rather, for me, I would rather say, I don't get what you're telling us or I don't agree with what you're trying to do. Uh, tell me more. And then you go and, you go and explain to them and, and, and fight your corner. I, I, I wouldn't mind that at all as an experienced player. I, do, I dare say you're the same at hearts. I, I know you would never say this yourself, but I know you never play, you've not played consistently, but any time we spoke to Robbie Nielsen, he, he, it seems to me that you're the guy that brings that to hearts. Uh, We've got quite a young squad, to be fair. So I think there is that sort of, people call it leadership groups in every team. Uh, and we've got a sort of three or four that 
try to dive that in, but like you say, you need that at every club. And to be fair, Snoddy's obviously just came to us and I knew Snoddy when he was 18 and now he's in here when he's 35 and completely different. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's talking about professional. He used to have Pringles for his dinner <laughs> no. when he was 18. <laughs> no, he so like, you're, you're still having them for your dinner, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm still having them. So, but no, you see nothing but salad on his plate, which is why he's still playing at a good level at 35. He's went down there, played in the Premier League. It's amazing, stopped. isn't it? Lemon in the water and uh, green tea and diet is incredible. Mate, you're this, this is a, honestly, I, I've said that. I've told this story in the podcast. Like for the Snoddy I knew, to then go into obviously Premier League with Leeds and West Ham, and like within the space of maybe a year or two, the difference him as a professional. We went to Ibiza for a large holiday, and he opened his suitcase, and it was full of protein bars. Honestly, <laughs> was it full of protein bars? Uh, and I was like, yeah, pot what noodles the fuck and a square sausage. <laughs> <laughs> no, how's this full of Johnny's? <laughs> I, honestly, I couldn't believe it, but I mean, look at him. Look at the career. And uh, you obviously seen him. His talent was never in doubt. That had to happen. For yeah. Him. Oh, yeah, definitely. Aye. Because he's never, people actually, uh, uh, you, you, you would have seen it as well. See, when he made his first appearance for Hearts, people were already saying, he's overweight. He looks overweight. And that, that's always been snowed. Yeah. He's always had that look, that overweight look, that, that body shape. He's never been slimlined. He's, but he's, he's, he's no unfit. I'll tell you that right now. He can run all day. You still get your, Stats after games now, and he's still hit 12k at the age of 35. It's wow. like, there's obviously the, the reason he's got to where he is because that sort of time he hit in his career where he said, Right, I need to change the way I live my life. That's Do you know, I spoke to Big Broadfoot, said to me that Andy's one of the most vocal players he's ever played with in a dressing That's room. not a good thing, is it? No, but he said you were good with it. Have you always been like, aye? Aye, and by the way, no, in a good way because I probably wasn't. I'd never probably challenged my voice well up to the age of about 23. Like, I you? used to be a cheeky wee bastard, to be honest with you. When I was at Livy, like, I've told stories about the Gary bar. Bowen. That, uh, Gary Bowen pinning me up against walls when I'm 17 year old. And, but that was good for me. Like, it generally was. That, and that's something that you probably can't do now. Like, I think that sort of management style is going out the game. But for me personally, it was good for me because it drived that out me pretty quickly. And then when I got to Middlesbrough and Stratton, soon realised that, like, if you're going to be cheeky to Gordon Stratton he will make you feel that that size within 10 minutes we know something else so. that size in here <laughs> Fadi were you like when you were younger would you aye. be vocal in the dressing room to senior players and managers um, aye but no no really similar to what Andy was saying about being cheeky and no really no really giving a fuck about what you were saying it wasn't a, like I'd stand up for myself um, I was never I, I was never like Oh, come on, the motivator, because you left that to the, the older players, but as you got older, you take that responsibility on, and it comes to, again, passing on, passing on what you've seen other older players, you know, passing on to you, taking that responsibility of, if training's a shambles, if players don't don't care in training, or if they're not living their life right, or they're no, it looks like they're not caring, laughing and joking after a defeat or after a game, then I, I would have, I would have, without doubt, challenged them as I got older because you need to be. Snoddy's actually the perfect example. Snoddy's a young boy. Everybody spoke about him. What a player, Robert Snodgrass. Got to do this. Snoddy's probably was as close to the edge of never being heard there again yeah. as a player. To turning that round and and making the career that he's had is is incredible. Right, big round of applause for our panel. It's been excellent. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll, we'll thank everyone for coming thanks very much everyone yeah. for coming yeah, thank you very much guys